this chance that I have to bring it up to you guys. Uh, there's been some talk about increasing license numbers uh, for the commercial clam digging in Pine Point and Scarborough, and I just wanted to voice my opinion that as a clammer since you know for six or seven years now, um, I think that would be a terrible mistake and really wouldn't benefit the clammers um, or the clams in any way. And uh, I hope that when the topic does come up, you choose to you know not increase clam license numbers. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else would like to get up and speak? Good evening. My name is Mo Erickson, and I live at 288 Pine Point Road also. Um, I am coming up here because there are two things I want to talk about. Probably neither of them are, you're even going to address tonight, but... I know I read in the leader the other day about the 800 or so residents uh, units being proposed to the town. And um, when I hear of that and I hear about the new safety committee, I mean the safety building and expanding that whole police fire station, I think to myself, where's our pool? I want a pool in Scarborough. <laughs> I want a pool. I'm not alone. Everyone wants a pool. I think everyone could agree that this town needs a pool. We are shipping our kids off to Cape and Biddeford and everywhere else. We are the 90210 of Maine. Why don't we have a pool? I think if we're going to, if we are going to insist upon adding more and more housing to this town, let's have a benefit from it all. I think a pool is something that everyone, most people, old, young, would enjoy. You get revenue from uh, swim lessons, from all, all kinds of things. So I beg you guys, please, put in a pool. That's my first gripe. My second is I know that um, down in Pine Point where I live, and I grew up and I lived there all my life, that there's a new um, restaurant that's going to be going in at Conroy's. And I know that you have heard me complain to you for the last three years about the parking on the Pine Point Road, but no one can get anything done because the DOT gets involved in it. It's a, depart it's a main state road. But all of a sudden, the Baileys have bought Conroy's, and the DOT has miraculously given them parking so they can have more parking for that restaurant. I don't know where the entrance is going to be, where the exit's going to be, but I can tell you, at that rotary, it's going to be a colossal mess. And just mark my words, it's going to be horrific. So I beg you again, you have five or six months until parking starts on the Pine Point Road. Fix it. Stop letting people park there. It's going to be a horror show. Also, I don't know how the Baileys got that all that extra, well, I won't say all, but their extra parking, but I just wish that we could find a way to fix that rotary because it's going to be a mess this summer. And n none of you guys live down there, I don't believe. So if you're there on a, really on any Sunday, any Saturday, any sunny day from the 4th of July until Labor Day weekend, you've you got to go down there and see what I'm talking about. Otherwise, you really have no idea. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else I'd like to speak from the public? Going once, twice, we'll move on. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, moving on to item number five, minutes from December 7, 2016, the will of the council. So moved. Second. Any adjustments or items of correction for the clerk? Not seeing any. All those in favor? Well, that's unanimous. And item number six, adjustments to the agenda. I do not have any this evening. Item seven is um, treasurer's warrants. We'll sign those as we go along through the meeting. And we'll move on to the first order of business, order number 16-080. The seven o'clock public hearing and action on the following applicants who have applied for renewal of the manufactured housing community licenses. The first um, um, community is Crystal Springs Manufactured Housing Community on US Route 22. Pinecrest Manufactured Housing Community at 126 U.S. Route 1 and Hillcrest Manufactured Housing 
126 U.S. Route 1. Any comments from the town manager before we move forward? No, uh, other than the code, uh, code office has inspected them and we do recommend approval. And is there a motion from the floor? So moved. Second. Oh, I apologize before, so um, I do need to open up for a public hearing. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on the item? Not seeing any. Um, motion? So moved. Second. Seconded by Mr. Hayes. Any comments from Council? Everything. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Councilor. Um, to the town clerk, everything's up to date as usual with them. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So I see no reason for this not to move forward either. Any other comments or questions? Just as an aside, it's really not as usual. Uh, the councilor might recall Crystal Springs has been a challenge for us through the years, mm -hmm. and um, we're pleased to report, frankly, during my tenure here, this might be the first year that it comes to you with a clean uh, recommendation from us. So we're very pleased uh, having worked with them. Usually we have to wait. We yeah. Usually right. we wait for them. Excellent. Any other comments? Not seeing any. All in favor? That's seven. That's unanimous. Order number 16-081, it's a 7 o'clock public hearing and discussion on the renewal request for a food handler's license for Michael Hoglin doing business as Countryside Butchers and the Painted Turtle located at 89 County Road. And I'd like to open up the floor to uh, public comments. Anybody that would like to speak? If you can step up to the podium. Uh, ben Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. I just had a question reading through the documentation. On December 5th, uh, it was noted that uh, the Painted Turtle and I, I don't know what the butcher's stores would be uh, billed $300 for each day. They were uh, out of violation. And then in a later documentation on December 16th, they were just going to pay a penalty of $300. Um, to me, those are two very large differences as it seemed in the documentation that it was proven that it, it, it was trying to make a point that the pain and turtle did receive every notification from the town that the information uh, about their violations um, was going to 89 Country Road and they do receive their mail there so I was wondering is it just the $300 or is it going to be the $300 plus every day in violation because to me $300 seems uh, a little bit on the lenient side for the number of days that they were out of violation and from what I could read the um, uh, from my understanding their uh, idea of dodging sort of the town's pleas to for them to get into code and to get their license renewed thank you thank you any other comments Good evening, Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive, Scarborough. Um, I'd certainly uh, second his comments. I thought in that letter it did say you could char charge him up to $300 a day, and the way it's written, it appears at the <coughs> uh, There's just, as the letter says, there's willful uh, neglect here. Uh, he's gone six months without the license. Uh, we can't seem to put lights in the, in the emergency exits. We can't seem to uh, fix replace fire extinguishers after six months, uh, I would certainly suggest that you have a, a larger uh, fine or whatever you want to call it than, than $300. I think that's just um, an embarrassment, if you will. And my uh, question is, uh, <coughs> if the person is not in compliance by February, does it, the place automatically shut down or does it have to come back to council? And my answer to my own question is, given the amount of time and thumbing its no the person thumbing their nose at the town trying to work with them, uh, I think it should be automatic if it can be. Um, there's certainly been a lot of effort put in by the town. <coughs> um, at one time, my parents had a, a corner store. We sold fruits and vegetables and so forth. You want to make sure that stuff is, held, is, is dealt with properly, that it's a safe environment. And uh, we certainly read all the time about other businesses, people like that. For some reason, which you know is alien, I'm sure, to everyone here, uh, they choose not to do it. I just don't understand it. And uh, I think the person's had more than enough time to correct these. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else that would like to speak on the item? Anybody else? 
Uh, seeing any, before I turn it over to the council for a motion and conversation, I'd like to have the manager uh, answer some of those questions for us. Sir, zoning administrator uh, um, Brian Longstaff is here and has been working directly on this matter, and perhaps I, I would flip it over to him just <coughs> for more substance, but as he takes the podium, <coughs> Uh, just as a general rule, staff, uh, we do try to be lenient. These are local businesses. We certainly uh, do everything in our power to make sure they're safe environments, but also the businesses are able to continue operating. And so uh, I, I believe it's possible the fine amount could be higher, uh, but that's kind of the perspective that we bring this recommendation to you with. And if you'll allow Brian, I think he'll provide some more detail. Sure. Good evening. Thank you, um, Tom. Uh, yeah, to respond to some of the, the public comments, uh, the ordinance does say that the uh, the town can levy a fine of up to $300 a day. It doesn't say it must, um, and that's for the first offense. Uh, it can, for a subsequent offense, levy a fine of up to $500 per day, um, and again, that's the second offense. It doesn't say it must, and I think, I don't believe this business has been um, assessed a penalty. Um, at least in my tenure here, and this is, so this is why we are instituting a fine of $300 just to let them know that we are serious. My personal philosophy is that I would rather have him correct, put the money into correcting the deficiencies to make it safe for the public to be there rather than to penalize them with a lot of penalties and not get the work done that needs to be done. Subsequently, then we're going to keep, a, as you Notice in the memo, the third condition was that we do an interim inspection, which we don't normally do, which is usually an annual inspection. I'd like to do an interim inspection with the, the council's help of putting that condition on the business to make sure that he is towing the line, that the restaurant is safe, that the, the butcher shop is, is uh, um, keeping these systems up to date um, and serviced. Um, and the light bulbs and the lights and, and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, we're going to start paying a lot more attention um, to those businesses, not just this business, but those businesses that are sort of chronic abusers. There aren't that many. Um, most people, as, as the gentleman said, um, you know, take that responsibility seriously and keep the public's uh, health and safety and welfare, um, you know, at the forefront. This business hasn't done as good a job as some, um, obviously. Um, but we'd rather see him fix, we'd rather stay on him to fix and put the money into the building and get those systems corrected rather than slap him with a lot of money in fines. The next time it happens, yeah, we'd probably be coming to the council for a little bit more of a, a penalty. Thank you very much. Um, before we, uh, if there's any questions for staff, um, if you can have a motion from the floor. So moved. Move to approve with conditions as recited in the attached material. Would you like to second that? Second. Thank you. Um, questions for staff from council? I do. Um, I don't know <laughs> him. Um, do you feel like he is going to, if we grant this and this is, has he seen these conditions? Yes, I spoke yeah. with, uh, he actually hasn't seen him. I spoke with him by the by telephone today to read down through the, the conditions that I was proposing. I informed him that the council didn't necessarily have to follow my recommendations. Right. Uh, and they certainly could could come up with more stringent ones, although that was probably not likely. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, uh, I did go through them, and he didn't have any objection to them. He was a little bit taken back by the penalty, which is the effect that I wanted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and did you feel as though he's going to be <coughs> compliant with those? Time will tell. Yeah. Um, I think it's important, too, to state to the public that it's not just businesses that we've been lenient with on the first time. We've also done it with, with personal housing where we've had issues with people that um, their homes are not up to code. We've tried to help them also. So it's not just a business per se that we've done this for. Um, and I have to agree with you that the ordinance does state that we can charge up to that, um, but we're not held to that. Um, and I have to agree with you. I think, you know, first, this is the first offense. Um, you know, some of these issues are obviously um, serious and need to be handled. But I do agree with you that we should give him the opportunity um, and the resources he needs to use his resources to take care of these issues. I would hate to see that building um, vacant and um, lose two businesses out of Scarborough. Um, I do know people that frequent <coughs> both of those businesses and really love them. Um, so it would be um, my hope that the council would support your recommendations um, 
and that we get an update from you immediately um, if he fails to do these things. And it would be my impression, I would have no leniency the second time. The second time, I would, it would be my personal opinion that we impose all strict fines to the maximum, um, whether that shuts him down or not. He should not be allowed to have a business if he cannot keep our residents safe. Uh, Council Caswell is next. And uh, yeah, I noticed uh, you sent the letter out on December 5th, and he said you, uh, Mr. Hogland had 24 hours to contact the Department of Planning Codes. He did not do that. Is that correct? Um, from the time of receipt, we sent it certified mail. Um, the, because the letter was actually sent to the address that we had on file, which we're now told was the incorrect address, we corrected that. He got the letter on the 8th, signed for the receipt on the 8th, and contacted us on the 9th. Okay. Thank you. Council Donovan. Uh, condition one states uh, Mr. Hoagland must complete the remaining corrective actions by January 18, 2017. Should Mr. Hoagland fail to correct all remaining violations by this date, the council shall suspend or revoke the food handler's license. Uh, in writing that, was it your intention that it would be automatic or that it would come back to us at our meeting following January 18th? Yeah, I think the way it's worded, it would have to come back to you, um, although we would be tracking his progress. Given the fact that some of this work has to be done by outside sourcing in the holiday season, I wanted to make sure I, I didn't set him up to fail mm -hmm. um, because he's at the whim of their schedule, not necessarily his, his schedule. This isn't stuff he can do himself. Uh, some of it. Most, actually, everything that's left is not stuff that he can do himself. So he is at the whim of other service providers, so I want to make sure, like I said, I don't want to set him up to fail. I want him to, to do it. So I think if the 18th rolls around and he can show me a, 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 a contractual agreement that the guy isn't going to be there till the 21st, that's the date, I'd, I'd probably give him that. And then if that failed, then we'd be coming back to council for, for that you. revocation. Any other council questions? <coughs> Actually, I have a question, if you don't mind. Um, so just for the public's uh, um, edification, food handlers' licenses come to us annually for approval, <coughs> um, or new ones do. However, the renewal of them are generally handled by the town clerk automatically. So this is coming to us solely because there is a contingent issue with the, uh, the license, correct? Uh, yes, because he failed yep. to renew, it's treated as a new, a new application. Sure. So the question, um, so um, the reason why I asked that question, um, I kind of knew it ahead of time, was that um, the tone of the letter suggests that there's a historical behavior problem with the applicant or the licensee that has never been shared with us before because that's automatically handled. So I don't want anyone to think that the council has been um, permissive of that type of behavior because I don't think it's appropriate that a well, a well known business in town that's been here for many years, it's not like it's a new one that doesn't know how to do business can behave that way. So I hope that once this is resolved, the behavior also changed with that flexibility that we've given and that we don't have to go through that experience for our staff as well. Yeah, that's kind of the effect I'm trying to have in this case. I, um, there has been a sorted history with this business, but it's been mostly with the uh, annual inspections and the follow-throughs uh, by the fire department and just just generally kind of a slow response from the, from the business. We have a few that, that are that way. Um, again, it's not not necessarily widespread. There are yep. a few problem children, if you will, that we have to deal with over and over again, and that's been the case with this, but it hasn't had to come to council for uh, before this time. And, and I did want to mention, it wasn't that long ago, we also <coughs> had another s business that was an eatery that had a similar issue regarding some violations that went through this process with you and was very successful, if I remember correctly. Yep, I'm failing to remember which one you're talking about. I'll tell you later. I, I, <laughs> the seafood joint on Pine Point Road. <laughs> um, any other questions or comments? <laughs> Not seeing any. Uh, the will of the council. All of those in favor? That appears to be unanimous. Thank you. And uh, moving on to old business, there is none at this time. Under new business, we have order number 16-088. It is the first reading of the Eighth Amendment to Contract Zone 9 by the residents at Gateway Commons, Divine Capital LLC, formerly New England Expedition, pursuant to Chapter 405.2, uh, I guess that would be Chapter 405, Section 2, Subsection 
one, five, and C of the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance and referral to the Planning Board for further review. What I would like to do, um, if you don't mind, um, is first I wanted to give a small background on the contract. We normally have public comments um, before um, the presentations. What I would actually like to ask is that we actually have the public comments after the presentation so that they get to see the full presentation. Um, but in conjunction with that, I really wanted to provide, I had asked the manager about providing at least a little bit of a timeline because this project has been, um, or the, the issue of this project has been in our uh, coffers for quite a few uh, years. And so I just wanted to give a high level background about the entire project, including its previous owners. So in, September, in um, January of 2007, it tells you how long it's been a decade that this was an initial contract between Scarborough and um, what was then the Gateway Shops at Scarborough. In September of that same year, there were modifications to the provisions for signage. In November, there was additional um, provisions made for to add educational institutions into this zone. There was also additional um, May 2008 modifications for signage and banners and light poles in September 2009 was not necessarily an amendment, but the uh, Gateway Square property was conveyed by quick claim deed to the New England Expedition uh, 2 group. And then in March 2010, we extended a uh, substantially complete deadline to March of 2013, so we gave them three years to move to a substantially complete phase. In July of 2010, we also added additional specifications to support the program, uh, excuse me, the project, and then additional signage specifications were changed in 2011. The actual transfer of ownership uh, to gate, of Gateway Square transferred in 2015, and here we are in 2017 now talking about what more can we do to support the project. So with that, I just wanted to kind of give a high-level overview of the timeline that we've incurred up to now, um, and then turn this over to Tom for introductions and the presentation. Right. Uh, just to one further piece of history. Uh, none of the history really is relevant to this project. It's worth noting, but there is, uh, there's 10 years or better of history. It is important for folks to remember kind of the why there's a contract zone there in the, in the first place. And it really had to do with the Cabela store being of its size. It, uh, I think the requirement was a 20,000 square foot retail limitation at the time. This is a 130,000 square foot building, so obviously they needed some relief there. The council at the time, uh, I think, had the wisdom of saying retail is all well and good, <coughs> but we really want to uh, see some results in commercial development along the parkway. and so. The property that we're going to be talking about tonight is the so-called or former Gateway Square property, and uh, and the contract zone extends to both the shops and the squares, and there was a lot of incentives worked into that to encourage development on this property. Unfortunately, 10 years in, uh, infrastructure has been put in place, but there's no uh, there's been no development to date. So that's kind of the, the back history, if you will. And uh, this evening, representatives from Divine Capital are here tonight. Uh, they promised to be 15 minutes or so, and I, I think it's probably best that they do proceed with the presentation first. I am hopeful that they'll potentially answer many questions you have, but if not, I'm sure they'll be willing to take questions. And we have a number of staff resources here uh, should the council need it as you proceed. Um, hey, thanks, Tom. Um, my name is Ben Devine, and I'm representing uh, the development group uh, in our proposal for uh, 288 um, multi-apartments uh, uh, at the uh, Hagus Parkway. Um, my, my development partner is KGI, um, and they're, they're here tonight, uh, just uh, Rick, Rick Renera and Dave Yetten. Um, you should be familiar with our group. Um, KGI and Divine Capital developed uh, Scarborough G Gallery uh, some 10 years ago. Uh, that was the Walmart Supercenter, the Lowe's, uh, the Red Robin, um, we worked, it was about a two to three year project on 60 plus acres. Uh, worked very closely with the town. We're very proud of that project. Um, uh, the the uh, interaction between um, staff and uh, the development team was terrific and uh, uh, that's a good project. Um, we come here today uh, to do a, a very, very brief overview. Uh, I understand what this is, is for our first reading of the eighth contract zone amendment and as Tom has introduced it, uh, you folks are very familiar with this, this contract zone. We're seeking I think very modest um, amendment to allow the vision of what the Haigas Parkway should be which is a sort of a vibrant uh, multi-use area and so uh, 
I'd like to uh, show you what our vision is and ask that you uh, that you listen to us and uh, and uh, support us as as we move forward. Again, we understand that this is if we get through tonight, this is just the beginning of the project. We'll be back in front of the uh, uh, planning board, open for public hearings, town council, and um, uh, we know it's very. We've worked in Scarborough before. We know it's it's a very thorough process. Um, Tom gave a, a brief history on the background, and it's it's really our position that this contract, the eighth contract zone amendment, really does fit with what the folks uh, that drafted this zoning uh, back 10 years ago envisioned. Sort of a vibrant, uh, multi-use <coughs> development. I don't think they saw this as strictly a, a residential play, but I think they saw that this area should be uh, sort of work, play, live, and that we believe that given the fact that it's 2016, uh, this project that we're bringing forth really fits with that vision. Um, the site's probably the most studied site in southern Maine. I, I know there's a Fairchild that looked at this site. Um, that's back in the day when server and office parks were popular. Um, TD Bank, it just, uh, I know from a retail perspective, there's been a lot of retailers that have looked at it and just given the fact that it's 2016, um, that particular uh, uh, type of development, the uh, suburban office, <coughs> large box retail, that's evaporated. and from a company that's just built millions of square feet of it, I don't think it's coming back. And uh, uh, we think that this product that we're uh, proposing here, which are 288 uh, luxury uh, multi-apartment units, uh, are going to really appeal to the town. Um, we're talking about a, a development, a product that is going to bring uh, the educated workforce. We're going to hear about the demographics, these are teachers, these are uh, folks working at Maine Med, Hannaford, uh, IDEX. Uh, this is going to uh, appeal to a, a segment of the residential population that's really choosing not to buy homes. Um, you're going to hear that it's very little impact on the uh, municipal services, but a lot of be benefits from a, a, po a population base that's, that's going to be terrific from Scarborough. Uh, so what I'd like to do uh, is briefly introduce the team and, and let them sort of respond after make their, we'll each make a brief presentation, then sort of answer the questions that you must have about a project of this scale, sort of the timeline of it all. But I'd just like to <coughs> identify folks in the audience here, uh, starting with the, the landowners, uh, Glenn Grant and the Grondins. Uh, they have quite a history on the site and could certainly uh, uh, give you any background about uh, why they think I think this is the right project at the right time. We also have uh, Rick Cheney, who uh, certainly is a well-known uh, former chairman of the planning board here and the author of uh, that Hagus, Hagus Parkway uh, amendment, and I'm sure he could fill in some, uh, some history about New England expedition and uh, why this might, might fit with that vi uh, vision. Uh, as far as our Great Island, as far as our development team of Divine Capital and KGI, Bill Fletcher is our attorney, local. Um, we've got Will Conway from Sebago. Uh, Will is also the engineer on Scarborough Gallery, certainly knows the lay of the land. And uh, as I said, Rick and David from um, Will can, can take you through construction timelines and the like. So uh, I guess I'm going to. Uh, Hand it off to Brad Wayman, and Brad's from uh, Sinover Conover Company in um, uh, Connecticut, and I think we're really, really fortunate to be able to show you exactly what this proposal can look like for Scarborough. This development team just finished 280 units of a similar, almost identical project, and so a lot of the questions you have, I think. Uh, other planning, another planning board's asked, and, and Brad's answered. So I'd like him just to kind of run through what what the residents at uh, uh, Gateway Commons would look like. Well, Brad takes the stage. Please go ahead, Brad. Um, there is a letter that was provided at your place this evening. It's uh, it's from a zoning official from East Line, Connecticut, that uh, perhaps speaks to many of the points that we'll hear right now as well. 
you'll see up on the screen in one second. Um, kind of a, a presentation that we have that walks you through East Line. Um, they're very, very similar communities to Scarborough. They're seaside communities where population increases significantly during the summer months. The median income is almost identical. The school system, size of school system, student population is almost identical. So there's a lot of, real lot of similarities. There's a major highway passes through that has close proximity uh, exit and entrance ramps for our, for the site in East Lyme as it does at Scarborough. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about the type of resident that we have seen, the resident profile that we have in East Lyme, is that they're lifestyle renters. They are making a conscious decision to rent and not buy. So they're millennials, they're baby boomers, they're retirees that want a very highly amenitized living situation. So they have, we have on-site pools, we have fire pits, we have dog washes, we have places to wash your car, we have a whole host of it, a, sm a gym, a uh, movie theater indoors. So there's all these, they, they're choosing to live in this location, in this type of style housing and not buy. So the rental, the rental price point on these that when we built this is, it's somewhere between $1,400 and $2,200 a month, which is we find that's it's very acceptable. We're looking at a median income on most of the, the residents that are at Gateway, somewhere between 80 and 100,000, some over that uh, for their for the units. Um, there was a lot of concern um, with the town about the impact on the school system. So the 288 units that are built now, they're 90% occupied. We have had we have a population of under 21 of 23 people. Of those 23, eight of them are infants, so there's 13 children that have impacted the school system. In the town had originally, we had provided them studies that said there would be 50 students that would impact the school system. We found that not to be true. And what we've also found is that of that new student population, it's not new. There's been a movement within the town of pe people that chose to stay in town and live in, live in an apartment community or, in the case of a split family, the, one of the parents might now live in this and want to keep their kid and child in the same school system, so now they can stick the bus to this property or bus to where their original home had been. So we're finding that the actual impact of new students of the 13 is, some, is either six or seven. So it's been very, very minimal impact on the school system on what we found. We've also found that it's very important to uh, be able to supply this type of amenity package. You have a minimum of 250 units because you need to supply on a significant on-site staff for leasing, for maintenance of the facilities. To keep They're used to a very high level of service. Every, all the hallways are vacuumed on a daily basis. We have granite countertops. There's all stainless steel appliances. There's uh, plank flooring in the unit. So as you can see on your screens right there, there is a very high level of finish that are, is expected in these units for this type of renter. We've also seen from the town and as from that letter we have we had a very long extensive relationship with the town is that they've noticed this fairly significant what we call a multiplier effect of these people that are living in the community have very high disposable income so they're using that disposable income to eat at the local restaurants to shop at the local stores a lot of that is staying within the local community it's not being exported out of the community which we think is a huge plus to keep building that fabric of community Uh, so I would, I would end with that um, we first approached East Lyme and we had standing room only in the high school to talk about the project. And by the time the project actually started, we had a line of people standing there to support the project. And now, as you can see what's been built there, the town has been extremely supportive. It's very high quality, very high amenity package. We actually have a number of people that work within the town living there. So. With that, I am going to turn it over to Will, who's going to talk about some of the traffic uh, considerations and the revenues that would be generated for the town through the impact fees, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, I'm going to use a, a lot of numbers tonight, so, um, but before I do that, I'd just like to, to make some points about the project will have very little uh, impact on municipal services. Um, Brad mentioned the, um, the low school impacts. All of the roadways will be private uh, within the development, so there'll be no snow removal um, on the part of the town. 
Uh, trash removal will be handled privately, so no impact on the town uh, in that respect. And uh, based on the demographics, this is a young, healthy population, so there will be limited impacts on emergency uh, responders within the town based on uh, the, the type of uh, project being proposed. The other thing that you all know <laughs> is uh, many years ago the town made a substantial investment in Hagas Parkway, the roadway and utility infrastructures, and really not a lot has happened there with the exception of Cabela's and a few businesses along it. This will provide, um, you know, I think sort of fits with the vision of what the town um, assumed that investment would uh, return uh, on, on the uh, investment itself. In terms of traffic impacts, the uh, project um, is currently permitted with uh, significant retail office uses, and those uh, traffic trips generated will go way down with this project. And here I go with some numbers. In the AM peak hour, uh, tr the traffic will be reduced from 502 trips to 158. In the PM peak hour, will be reduced from 790 trips to 188. So much less um, traffic impact on, uh, on your roadway system. In terms of financial benefits to the town, uh, there's lots of them. And I'll start with the annual property tax revenue uh, from this project is expected to generate 475000 to 635000 annually to the town. In addition to that, um, as part of the conditions, uh, we're hopeful uh, to, that you'll uh, send us to see the planning board that we'll impose as part of site plan review. There are impact fees on uh, the, the traffic, even though it's, it's little, there'll still be impact fees. Recreation fees, uh, school impact fees, and sewer impact fees which are considerable. The project will uh, generate a total of $1.55 million in impact fees. That's a one-time uh, fee. Not This is a, in addition to annual tax revenue. So quite a bit of, um, you could build a few swimming pools for that. <laughs> uh, in addition, and I don't have any numbers on this, this vehicle um, uh, inspection fees or registration fees will be considerable. Uh, perhaps north of $100,000 annually, we think. Um, and then it's, um, it's hard to uh, speculate, but there'll be during construction, uh, construction jobs generated, uh, as well as people using local services, restaurants, uh, and other services within the town as a benefit. And the last point I'd like to make is um, this is a shovel-ready project. Um, the Next group is going to talk about the time frame. Uh, the timing of the project is important, and as you've seen in the slides and if you've been to the site, uh, considerable infrastructure is already in place. A major loop road is in, utilities are in, the stormwater detention facilities are built. Uh, so we would be able to uh, mobilize and, and uh, realize these benefits for you uh, in a very short order. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce Rick uh, Granero from KGI, and he'll talk about schedule. Timing is <clears throat> pretty critical, and the way we look at this project is that because it's a destination location with a very high amenity package, that would be the first item that we'd want to get built. And if you take a look in the unrealistic maybe timeline of a developer. We, if we had permits by June of next year, the idea would be we'd be in the ground in the second half of 2017. So of the 288 units that we're looking for, those take about six to nine months to come online. So the first units available would be the spring of 2018. So initially we'd probably need 90 permits, 90 growth permits to get through the first year in 2017 the, per the building permits to get going on the first half of the project. As the rentals start in 2018, 
we would be working on the second half, and in 2018, we would need the second half of the growth permit. The entire project takes about two years to fully finish up. Um, what's good is that these are real dates, real time numbers, real schedules, because this is not a hypothetical theory that we're proposing. We just finished it. And it took us two years to complete the project. We fine-tuned it. We did a few things that we've learned to do better from East Lyme that we would propose here, and one is get the amenity package built right away because we had that wait. But with the winters here, if we start in the summer of 2017, you're not going to open a pool in December. Or, you know, we'll have to wait. But it all works out that the timing will run two years, six to nine months for the first departments to come on board. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. shouldn't have been handed the, baton, the uh, technology baton, clearly. Um, I'm Bill Fletcher. I'm the attorney on the team. Um, so you've heard about the project. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the current zoning and what we're asking for in the uh, Eighth Amendment to the contract zone, and then talk just for a minute about the process. Um, the property is within uh, the Highgus Parkway District. Uh, it's also part of a contract zone area. And uh, the history has already been given, so I won't, I won't walk through that. But there are certain aspects of the, um, the Highgus district um, that we need relief from in order to go, go forward with this project. One is the density requirement. Currently, under the district, uh, only five units are allowed per net lot acre of area. So for this site, we uh, estimate that about 125 units would be its limit without this, uh, without this amendment to the contract zone. And also, um, there's a mixed-use requirement under the district. So presently, you can only build residential units if you have a com commercial component. And uh, in the marketplace today, that just isn't feasible. So th those are the two primary aspects that the contract zone seeks to remedy. And the third component is, um, as contemplated under the growth man management ordinance, the town council is allowed to authorize the planning board to issue the appropriate number of growth permits um, as Rick mentioned, it isn't a request for 288 permits in the first year. Um, the way the growth permits are calculated, it's a percentage of the overall building permits you're asking for based on the size of the units you're building. So we estimate in the first year we would need approximately 90 growth permits and then the remaining 90 to fall um, during 2018 and 2019. So the Eighth Amendment to the contract zone really is doing those three things. It's it's lifting the requirement that the project be mixed use. It's, a, it's alleviating or relieving um, the density requirement. And it's authorizing the plan, planning board to issue the appropriate number of growth permits um, from the reserve pool in order to allow the project to go forward. Um, and what we're asking for tonight is really the first step. It's the first reading. Um, so the, if the council were to vote tonight, it would be recommending that the Eighth Amendment be forwarded to the Planning Board for review. There would be a second, there would be a public hearing. Uh, the Planning Board uh, would receive comments. They would review the Eighth Amendment. They would report back to the Town Council. At that same meeting, they would simultaneously do a preliminary re review of the site plan um, and a preliminary approval subject to uh, the final approval of the Eighth Amendment. At that point, the Eighth Amendment would come back to the Town Council for a sec second public hearing and a second reading. Um, assuming that process finalizes, once the uh, approved contract zone is signed and recorded, the planning board would continue on their, um, on their process of reviewing the site plan and the subdivision. So I believe that concludes our presentation. Um, we'll welcome, welcome any questions you have. Um, so be f if you don't mind, um, any comments from staff before? Because uh, we did promise to have public comments before we got into our conversation. Great. So any any closing comments for the presentation? No, I think the thorough presentation, again, staff uh, is here and available as resources to you as you go through this discussion. Great. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you. So I would like to, if, um, we will have questions as counselors, so I would like to at least open up the, uh, the floor to any public comments. If you'd like to uh, approach the podium and uh, have those comments or questions that we'll keep track of and make sure that they're answered. Mm -hmm. Yes, my name's the same and where I live is the same. Uh, Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. I live uh, fairly close to where this new project is going in and I don't have any concerns about it being there. Uh, it's the Hagus Parkway. It's supposed to be a commercial area. We've got, you know, they spent millions of dollars on the infrastructure there. They spent millions of dollars on the highway. It used to be just a simple two-lane road intersection there at the turnpike. Uh, the toll plaza has been rebuilt. I think these are all positive things. Um, last week at the um, at the workshop, I probably like many of you was very surprised. It's the first time I heard this number of 800 and plus units, and uh, so that was a shock at the beginning. But as I went through the the, um, the program and, and the presentation, um, it sounded better and it seemed like okay we, we're talking about the school which is the one area that certainly could impact us very big and uh, Mr. Rivera got up there he spent millions of dollars in Westbrook and other places he was able to give us what's happening today in the marketplace and and the obviously the demand is there for, for this kind of housing um, I reviewed or looked through most of that information that you put up on the website um, and I still look. I was looking for a negative. What, what, you know, what don't I like here? Or what's, what's, what's a big concern? And I really, you know, I don't know this uh, Amendment Eight piece. That's for the lawyers to deal with. But I think uh, in the presentation tonight uh, seemed to fit quite well with what what we heard last week, and also what was out on the website. Um, we have other pluses in that you've already, we've already as a town. Uh, uh, worked with this developer before. Uh, that's certainly a plus. There's always, you know, they know how how we do business here. They know that it, we just don't let things slide. Uh, so I think that's a, a plus for them, a plus for us. And certainly, you know, the fact that they just built this project. You know, it's just a different different zip code. And um, in the building, in the uh, commercial business, certainly building housing, they have to do it now because the market keeps pivoting and changing. And so you know, uh, like putting it through the comprehensive planning process, which could take a year, 18 months, 24 months, then it's like uh, TD Bank North. They <coughs> wanted to build out, of the, out there, and I don't know the particulars on that, but it didn't work because certain things had to be done. So I certainly uh, uh, ask you to, uh, to vote in the affirmative of this. Uh, we really, like they say, it's going to the, the planning board. We'll hear more stuff, more about it there, more questions, and it comes back to you folks. So. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Anybody else I'd like to speak? Hello again, uh, Ben Howard, Seven Windsor Pines. Um, to me, when I was reading through the legislation, I was just kind of uh, weary as how the letter was written. Um, one of the first things that popped up to me was millennial. Um, I guess that's sort of what my age group has become, but to me the idea that this place would cater to millennials, I, w I was a little bit wary of it um, from my own personal opinion. Um, that being said, you're, you're expecting, from what I read, it's a little bit different now, you're, you're expecting the income to be about 80000 to to $100,000 for these people. I, I don't know of many millennials that are making eighty dollars to $100,000. Um, especially since um, I, kn I know you could have a um, partner or someone that you're living with and you could share it, but 33% of the housing is single, single uh, bedroom homes. And even then, the, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Maine's income is 40, average income is $43,000 per year. Um, and we only have, according to that as well, is 600,000 jobs. Now, yes, the demographics are very, very similar between East Slime and Connecticut um, based on the breakdown of the population, the age groups and everything, but there's a, a big difference between Maine and Connecticut. In Connecticut, there's 1.6 million jobs, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 
and the average income there is $56,000. That's a $10,000 difference. So I, I'm sort of worried that we won't fill this, that, that there's, there will be a difference between Connecticut and, and, and Maine itself. Um, especially, again, from the millennial standpoint, it almost just is a buzzword to the older gen. Oh, yes, the young people will come and live in this community. To me, it, 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 that sort of area doesn't scream it. I, I really like what's happened downtown here with the school and the Romeo's restaurants and they're the ma and pa business and that's, that's something that more millennials like. Over there and over by the Walmart area where we're building these things, it's the big stores, you know, big name brand, uh, Red Robins and, and other things. So uh, to me, I was a little bit wary of that. Wary of that. Again, uh, the promise that you know maybe we'll build more retail should the housing market do well enough. There's no promise of this retail coming in. Again, that's that's just a place. You know, I, I think 10 years ago there was a vision and there was goals to do things with it. And I, I would hope the council would sort of wait until those visions were foreseen. Right now the area is sort of just getting filled with things. Right. There's Horizon Solutions, which is uh, a wire PLC uh, facility sort of deal. There, there. That's a smaller business. And then there's the salt pipe, uh, a rock climbing, a recreational place. But to me, it just seems like the vision for that area has been sort of lost. And I, it, it, and you know, we do need more housing in Maine. I, I've looked for housing, and it's definitely on the short end. But it takes two years. We're about to go into a whole new presidency. We don't know, really know where the country's going. Um, and I understand, I believe this is my time here. <laughs> but um, I, I'm sorry that I go on. But uh, to me, I, I, I would just like to hear more information about exactly who's moved into East Lyme. And I, I want to see more of the data. This is the first time the council has really uh, posted a lot of data. And I really appreciate that. So thank you for everything tonight. Thank you. Anybody else I'd like to speak from the public? Sir? Yeah. Uh, good evening. My name is Rick Cheney. Um Just to be clear, I'm not involved in this project in any legal capacity. Uh, I did, was given the opportunity by Attorney Fletcher to review the Eighth Amendment to the Contract Zone Agreement, so there was a little bit of my input there. But that was on behalf of the New England Expedition, a uh, company I do represent, which uh, owns the Gateway Shops. A um, little bit of further history that the Chair forgot to mention was this little event in 2008 called the World Recession, where we, our economy practically collapsed everywhere. Uh, that was the primary reason why the project then just didn't happen. Uh, Fairchild Semiconductor had signed a lease. They were coming to that project. They were going to build a world-class facility. That back then was sort of the vision of the area, high-class um, office projects. That didn't happen. And unfortunately, the project couldn't go forward again um, for anything that New England Expedition could do. The vision has changed a lot now, I think, for this area. Uh, the shops has some uh, facilities that I'm sure will benefit from this project. Uh, the people that will live there will undoubtedly spur further development in the shops, more retail, perhaps more restaurants, other uses that will cater to these uh, residents. I also think that things will happen at Scarborough Downs in the not too distant future. And again, this type of project in that area will support the uses that I think will be built there. So uh, the New, New England Expedition is a strong supporter of this project. I think you have a letter in your materials, hopefully from Mr. Feldman. And I would encourage the uh, council to vote tonight in favor of the amendment and let the process move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak? Would like to stand up, sir? I'm Glenn Grant. Chairman Baybine's looking at me here. <laughs> we go back a long way. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not just part of the public. I'm one of the owners. And if we had uh, two and a half hours, I could lead you through step by step from the time we cut the throughway through 
for the turnpike, uh, for the, uh, I guess, parkway, when the state DOT told me that I had 30 days to clear the wood out of the area if I wanted it because it was going to happen. So I informed them there was a cemetery there they might want to know about before they started bulldozing. Anyway, it goes on and on. We have dragged our feet through some of the best potential deals for this land. It is one of the best locations, period, in New England. Access to the, to the airports, to the sea, to the local routes. It's all good. We went through a downturn in the economy, as Rick said, and New England expeditions folded. Prior to that, I had signed eight extensions. So it wasn't that we were in a hurry to take and stop the project, and ultimately they gave in, and I gave them credit for staying with it so long. What we have now, after all these lapses of different hot spots, whether it's retail or whether it's academia or manufacturing, now we have a need called housing. And the surveys support this, and we do too. The funny part is that originally, before the highway went through, the Haggis Parkway, I had a $50,000 check placed in my hand by a local developer, nice guy, Rocco Risberra, who wanted to build houses there. And I said, what? There should be something else. And there certainly has been. But now you have a shovel-ready piece of property that's been waiting too long, and I say that from the aspect of having to deal with the assessments over the years. Uh, the town's been very gracious, but we're up to date. Um, Ben and company, we chose over an offer from an, a big developer in Philadelphia and New York who offered to pay much more money, but we wanted local. <coughs> we have local. He's proven here in Scarborough and all over the place. His associates are proven. You've seen the footwork up here on the screen. And so please give it ample consideration and let this thing get off the ground. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mr. Rehearsed that. You're right on three minutes, Glenn. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> like he says, he goes way back. <laughs> Anybody else I'd like to speak? Not seeing any, uh, we'll close the public hearing uh, or public comments and open it up for questions from counselors. Council Rowan. Uh, so, the, I read through the. Uh, oh, well, I think that we we're going to go through some questions for staff uh, regarding any of the data, and then we'll go into a conversation. Isn't that how we've t typically handled it in the past? Well, you can do it. I can do it either way. We can do it either you way. Can still answer questions. Okay. Um, uh, we can start off if we can have a motion on the order, please. So moved. Second. And um, questions. Yep. Questions from counselors. Questions, comments. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I had a question. The the. Um, the intention is <coughs> Divine Capital is going to be the management company for this moving forward? Um, yeah, this is a joint venture uh, with uh, uh, KGI and Divine Capital. Uh, just like Scarborough Gallery, we develop and we own. Uh, the benefit of uh, this development is our partners here is, is Simon Conover, one of the largest uh, apartment uh, owners, managers, and developers on the East Coast. So they would be professionally managing it. I see. And um, you mentioned that when we were talking about the uh, the sound in Connecticut, East Line, yeah, um, in East Line, yep. That the rents were for between fourteen hundred and twenty two hundred. Was that for the same mix of um, uh, studios I, through three bedroom? Or? Correct. Okay, so the three bedrooms were running for about twenty two hundred. Correct. So the same level of amenity. Okay, um, and then uh, another question I have, if you absolutely. Uh, oh would be the, what's in front of us tonight is really the uh, decision on the contract zone. Was the, was the growth man management ordinance permit considered part of that on the table, or is, or is that something to be taken up at a later point? It, it's uh, part of the amendment in that it, it authorizes, through the town council, you'd be authorizing the planning board to issue the appropriate growth permits in connection with the project. Gotcha. 
So it's all it was in the hands. Yeah. And that's and that's and that authority is uh, embedded within the current growth management ordinance. The authority of the town council to do that. I, I just uh, wanted to speak to why that uh, was a requirement of that Eighth Amendment. Is we do need financing for these projects, and when you get to a lender, they want to know if you have all those permits, and they're going to want to know that we have the ability uh, to build X number of units. And there is a, as we studied East Lyme, Rick and Eric could speak to. We really do need to say in 2018 have 90 permits, uh, growth permits, in order to make the, the, the site viable so we can get a loan. And uh, that's kind of how we broke that out. Gotcha. Um, have, <clears throat> in any of these developments, have you ever done any inclusionary housing for uh, affordable units? Um, East Lyme is not uh, a project that has affordable units, but we are well aware here that part of this planning board process, that, that that's going to be a discussion. I know that's a new topic to the town council. And uh, you know we are uh, internally discussing that. Um, again, this is what we call a luxury uh, apartment, but I'm not sure that that, that is really relevant. We know that uh, as part of this uh, uh, process that affordable housing will, will be discussed. Great, thank you. Okay. Any other? Councilor Chiazzo? Uh, so, so three questions. Um, First one is, uh, have you determined how many parking spaces you offer per unit? Because obviously it varies. You're going from studio to third to three bedroom. So what's the average, I guess, per unit? Uh, in the project we have in East Lyme, we have one-third of uh, garages that represent one-third of the units. And then we typically look at, it was a town ordinance and what we needed to have in East Lyme. We actually exceeded that ordinance. We run about two parking spaces per unit, so whether it's a one bedroom or a three bedroom, it usually averages out that that's what you need to have. We found that the placement of the parking where they are to the doorway is a fairly important factor in the current population that wants to live there. So, yeah, to come so continue. Uh, yeah, two other, two other questions. Um, first one, um, so you did mention the 1,400 to 2,200. Uh, have you done any market surveys here locally to see if the if the market will support that kind of uh, rate? We we have done an informal market s survey in the market uh, that was provided support to that with by CB Richard Ellis, who rich who just recently sold two projects in South Portland, and our rents are very much in line with those were, and those were projects that are between. 10 and 14 years old. So this would be at a par on the rent side, but have a much more robust amenity package. I'd also like to take the opportunity to say that, um, like any real estate, uh, this runs in cycles. So we're obviously anxious uh, to, uh, to get into the market. Uh, this market would serve Greater Portland. Uh, there are other projects out there. I, I can't speak to, uh, to whether they'll all get built. I, I lived through uh, the uh, suburban office market in the 80s, and uh, there were a lot of office buildings, Eagle Brook and the like, that were on, on the plants, and they never got built. So I, I do have my uh, concerns that although there are 800 apartments uh, or 800 units, residential units in Scarborough, um, that they'll all get built. But this, this type of project, if someone were to do this in another community, that would definitely impact us. So timing is critical. Um, interest rates are rising. Construction costs are rising. Um, we understand this project will be well, well vetted, but uh, uh, we're anxious to, to do this, um, to get in the ground this year. And uh, if you can wait, there's going to be one more question. Yeah, sorry, last question. No, this is actually for staff. Oh, okay. um, have we, has our legal counsel reviewed the zoning amendment change, or will we do that during the planning board process? Town's attorney has been involved in the formation of the amendment in front of you, yes. And no questions or concerns, everything's... Well, it really was their work product. Uh, we made sure it, uh, it, it was intended to do, and uh, <laughs> I believe it's in keeping with what they look for, yes. Okay. Right. Thank you. Anything else? I'll start. Nope. Councilor Hayes? Yes, a couple quick questions. I think three or four questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> first question I had is on the financial side. I think you had referenced that the annual tax revenue to the town would be between 475 and 675 a year. 
But can you explain a little bit to me what the credit enhancement agreement is? Doesn't that suggest that in the early years, a lot of that tax revenue actually gets turned back to the developer? How does that, can you explain to us how that works and what the real net tax revenue might be in the first years of the project? Yeah, I, I can't speak to the net flow of dollars, but I, I do understand that there's a currently a credit enhancement agreement in place. Yeah, it's so, $5 million, I think. Yep, originally it was, I think, to expire in 2018 and maybe within the last couple of years was extended through until 2028 for the payout to the original participants. So that is, um, you know, something that the project is subject to um, you know, on both sides, both the Cabela side and, and our side. So that will impact, um, you know, the overall, I guess, net dollars initially running to the town, and that wasn't part of our, um, uh, you know, sort of run through and what the dollars look like. Uh, it's an yeah, ex existing I, agreement. So the 475 to 675 is the gross tax revenue. That's not right. The net that the town's going to actually receive. You That's right. It'll help the town pay off that credit enhancement obligation. So what we will actually see as tax revenue will be significantly less than that. Initially, yes. Probably the first five years. Uh, I, I don't recall what the analysis term of the agreement. would be about five years to about bring five that years. down to okay. full payout. Um, it's worth noting that um, the contract zone, as we introduced, uh, the credit enhancement agreement applies to the same geography <coughs> as the land, both the shops and the square. Separate and apart from the town, there have been <coughs> agreements, particularly through this uh, change of ownership, in terms of how they share in the proceeds of that credit enhancement agreement. And Rich Chenet in the audience, he probably can recite the stuff top of head, <laughs> but as I recall, the Gateway Square property that we're talking about tonight actually uh, enjoys 15% of that, whereas 85% goes to the shops. So just to be clear, right. what goes toward their bottom line is just 15% of that. The vast majority goes to the original developer who made the investment. Right, but my only point, when the town's not going to receive sure. that tax rate, that's Absolutely something true. we should, yes. as we project and plan. Yes, 875, right? Yep. Uh, 825 annual cap and an overall cap of 8.25. Second, second question I had, then this is really for staff. So we we started off last week hearing about in the pipeline. There's 855 sort of in the pipeline multifamily unit permits that are needed. What we're committing to tonight, as as we have heard, is 288 for this project. How do we how do we account for and what is the council going to have to approve to honor the 850 sort of permits that are in the pipeline? How do we do that? We, we're going to have to replenish the pool, right? We don't have enough to. So do we have an accounting for how that plays out in the next five years of how many exceptions we're going to have to make or how much we're going to have to replenish that pool? And isn't that a key decision about what we want to do before we commit to any projects to understand how many we are going to commit to? Well, I think what's being asked of you tonight is an initial commitment, and frankly, just in the last couple of weeks, we start to get a clearer vision of what sort of uh, impact on the ordinance there actually exists. A number of those in that pipeline uh, will actually uh, secure their permits this year, so those won't be, <coughs> they won't be needed going forward, if you will. And then as we heard tonight, we have a better sense of what they're phasing. Um, that matters. Uh, and the other projects, uh, the other large project, we're not aware of their exact schedule. So all of those, that's, there's a number of variables that affect uh, the answer that we're looking for. Uh, Dan Bacon is here, and he, I'm sure, can speak more eloquently to that. Um, but I, I believe you're right. I think the council will have to consider uh, opening the growth management ordinance and I don't know, replenishes the word or right-sizing that reserve pool to meet the expected demand. Pretty significantly, though, right? Because we're talking about... Perhaps not. I mean, many of these uh, units, the one-bedrooms are counted as half. So, um, as was mentioned, they're looking for 80 growth permits because of the, the housing type that they're proposing. 80 this year. Excuse me, 90. 90, 90 this year in the balance. 90. Year. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so there's just a number of variables. Uh, your point's well taken, and I think uh, you are correct that, that the council, should you wish to go forward, will be looking at the growth management ordinance, and we'll have to do a, a better job of advising you as to what the need will be. If, if you'll permit Dan, perhaps he can add some extra. I think I was just going to follow up that, um, <clears throat> since actually since the workshop that we conducted a week ago, um, the Griffin Road project 
has got financing, so they're likely to begin in February. So they, um, just to the end of the last week, pulled their growth permits under the current allocation. So the current year is 135. So that isn't something that needs to be accounted for next year. Um, that project is entirely elderly, you know, so in terms of impacts and the project style, that's different from really the thrust around the growth management ordinance in terms of pacing school population and, and that type of thing. Um, the Avesta housing project, actually Friday, a uh, project that the uh, council approved uh, about a year ago for contract zone, got the second piece of funding that they need. They were on the, the list for the kind of 800 or so units. So they're looking now, because of that funding that they got, um, looking to probably pull their growth permits this year because they're going to get started next year. Um, and I think within January we're going to, we have this project that's under consideration um, and the 79 Muzzy Road project, the Rosbera project, the started planning board review. So we'll have a better sense early in the new year in January as to <coughs> what their phasing looks like, what their kind of unit count looks like in terms of one bedrooms and two bedrooms. So I think you know, that that big 800 number all happening next year um, was, I'm sure it was intimidating and it, it ne didn't necessarily, uh, it may be concentrated at next year more than it needed to. It was just our best guess based on information we had in the last few months. So things are coming clearer, becoming more in focus, and I think um, by mid-January we'll have a better sense for it all to bring to the council as to this is the amount, if you support various projects, this is the amount that you can increase the reserve pool and um, you can have dialogue around that and see if, if that's of comfort to the council. So um, things are kind of shaking out where it may not be as big a number as originally anticipated as um, talked about a few weeks ago. And, and I guess my, just my last question would be, so, so based on that, it feels like there's a lot of urgency that this needs to be decided tonight to move on. What's sort of feeding that urgency? We heard a little bit about it, but if, if we were to wait to get some of this, these numbers finalized about where we are, what's, what's, what's the impact to your problem? Who's that question to? Any, anyone? Okay. Well, I, I think uh, any developer will, will say that time is the most expensive We've had this land under agreement uh, since the summer. We've spent tens and tens of thousands of dollars uh, to get to this point. Um, we're getting to the point uh, where we're looking at the overall market. Uh, we see the need. We see the need now. Um, we, uh, we will have to start talking to lenders. It's, no one's really going to take this project seriously if um, if my response to them is, uh, you know, it's unclear whether uh, we will have the requisite permits. I think folks need to understand the process, and I'm not criticizing you doing exactly what uh, a town council should do. From a developer, we need, we need to hit certain benchmarks. Every month, uh, certain dollars go out. Um, we can only... Uh, you know, we're a company that does different projects and uh, we have to kind of back the projects that are most likely to happen in, in the next 24 months. So, um, you know, uh, we'd, we'd like to know one way or the other. I, I certainly uh, understand this project. We've, as, you know, we spent many, many years developing in Scarborough and it's a terrific uh, environment um, and uh, we just need to know what the ground rules are and uh, respond accordingly. Thank you. Uh, Council Foley? Uh, and Will had a stand up first. Oh, I, I was ready to move beyond questions, but if we're still doing questions. Okay. So two, and I'm not entirely certain where to direct them to, one would be do we have an anticipated timeline between, so if we approve tonight, when, when do we think we would see this again at second reading? Is that two meetings from now, three meetings from now? Because for me that could influence my decision. I think Dan can probably best speculate when this will be back. Um, procedurally, in terms of process, they'll laid out the steps. Um, I guess the details of the steps would be the next uh, review is by the planning board. The planning board conducts a public hearing to get input like you received this evening. Um, and then 
um, as importantly, they begin their review of the project. And um, if this was a undeveloped site with, um, you know, not a lot of work, not a lot of work done in terms of engineering or infrastructure, it probably would be, you know, three meetings with the planning board to kind of work through what's the layout, where's everything going, um, what are the traffic implications, all those things. Because this site is pre-permitted and because its uh, infrastructure is largely in, a lot of their typical work is complete. Um, so in that way, the planning board review, I suspect, is going to be shorter. You know, whether it's one meeting or two meetings, um, it's really up to the board and, and the applicant and how far they get through that conversation. But it, it wouldn't be as much of, as if, you know, this was a greenfield, if you will. So um, I suspect that, you know, if things uh, get approved this evening in, a, in the first reading fashion, this would go to the planning board, I'm assuming, in probably late January. Um, Will uh, and his team have a better sense for where they are in terms of readiness to be to the planning <coughs> board, but it likely would go to the planning board maybe late January, uh, early February, and have one or two discussions with them. Um, and then it would come back to the council. So maybe that's, maybe that's late February, maybe that's early March. You know, it's really driven by their schedule and, and meeting schedules and their uh, success with the planning board. So I think that's... So fair to say late January at the earliest. I don't think they'd be back to you right. until February or early March, but Will's got, he's the one that's running uh, the engineers, so... <laughs> at the earliest. Um, yeah, February, March. And in terms of the growth management discussion, which is a parallel thing, that's something staff is prepared to come back to the council uh, with more information, better numbers, a better sense whenever you want to have that discussion. So that's really more up to the council. <laughs> and just for clarification, so the town council, when we receive it back, is actually a two-step process generally. It's a public hearing. Um, generally by itself. I have seen in the past where they've tried to combine that. We will want to discuss if that's applicable here or whether it should be separated sure. um, and then have a second reading after that public hearing. So there is a two-step process at the end when we receive mm -hmm. it back. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And then my second question, um, which was spoken to in part maybe about the Avesta project, but so I'm not a developer. Uh, no idea how your financing works, but is it is it always typical that you have to ha go when you go to your lenders? Because one of the pieces of urgency that I'm sensing is around the financing and needing to go to your lenders and say, hey, we've got all of this approved. Is there ever a process by which you say, we've got 90 approved for 2017, you know, we fully anticipate an the next 160 or whatever more will be approved in 2018? And do you get your financing incrementally as well? Is that ever a possibility? Um, it, it's a very good question, um, and I wrestle with that one. So th this is really kind of nuts and bolts of 280 units. Uh, we're basically losing money until we can build probably beyond 200. So uh, we need a, a critical mass uh, to get started. Uh, which is probably 90 growth permits. Um, it, there is a certain expense of scale, so once you mobilize, you want to, uh, you know, build as many structures as you can. And also at the same time, you're you're leasing toward the market, so you have, uh, say, 24 units in a building, two to three buildings under construction. You're constantly mm -hmm. leasing, and so it also mitigates some of the concerns that. Uh, Ben had asked about, are you building toward the market? Well, if we get into this and we build, um, say we build 180 units and they're not leasing, it, you know, we're not going to build spec uh, buildings. We have to, we, we, that's one thing this company, is, my, my company's never done is uh, spec. Um, we, we, we will build to the market. We, we do our studies. We're, we're not going to make mistakes. But to get back to your question, um, yeah, there is a critical mass of which we need to jumpstart the project. And then we'll know what we're successful when we, when we pull those second 90 permits. I did just want to get one point of clarification. I heard a couple different numbers for the number of growth permits. Um, what I heard when you were doing the pre presentation was that this would take 180 growth permits given the mix of housing. Is that correct? We're looking at 180 of the permits well, needed. That's what I understood. Approximately. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Council Donovan. Uh, Mr. Devine, uh, we, you know, we talked about timing's everything in your business, and we understand that you need to build as quickly as possible to take advantage of the marketplace, but you're also a victim of timing. Here we have 853 uh, units proposed. Uh, that's an extraordinary number for our community uh, to come online in 2017, 2018. Uh, I accept the municipal, the argument that municipal services would not be materially impacted from a cost point of view for uh, a luxury uh, apartment complex uh, because of the circumstances that you noted. Uh, we are all very concerned, and I know others uh, at the town council table share my concern about the risk of impact uh, on the school system. Uh, and the three bedroom units that are proposed are, uh, are really the critical element there. Uh, are you, without asking you to sign on the dotted line, uh, amenable to uh, considering eliminating the three bedroom units in a negotiation, as we all know, a contract zone Amendment is a negotiated arrangement. Um, yeah, I, I would uh, going to hand it over to to Brad because he really is the, the marketing guru here. Um, we really want to respond to the market, um, and we come forward. We don't don't have the answers to your growth management uh, uh, issues. Uh, I would feel the same way at 800 units is uh, seems like a lot. I do have a lot of confidence in town staff. Um, I think they'll understand these projects and I, I'm confident that if we were to pull 180 permits over the next uh, 24 to 36 months, um, th it will work well with the town. I, I'm confident that uh, staff will be able to uh, structure something that works uh, for the town. So we'll, uh, we want to be part of that process, but um, I'm confident that we'll, we're going to move ahead. Um, knowing that, you, that that it will work out. Any other questions? Uh, so, yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, yeah, as as to the three bedrooms, what we've found actually is that we have a number of corporate rentals, and there's a there's such a large magnitude of people who work from home now that one of those bedrooms is an office. Mm -hmm. So we found that the majority of the ch children that we have on site are not in three bedroom units. It's fairly equally split of the 13 school age children are in the three bedrooms and the two bedrooms. So it's typically someone that has a little bit higher income that's looking for a home office or they have a fairly regular visitor. It was, you know, maybe they're a partner that comes or a family member that comes and visits them. So that's what and, and I guess my question was, how integral to the success of the uh, balance sheet, uh, of the spreadsheet, are the 39 three bedrooms if those were 39 additional two bedrooms? Um, some of it has to do with the layout of the building because these are I don't want to call pre-canned buildings, but we have built this exact building. So to start changing the configuration, we're going to go back and now do an entire redesign of that building, gotcha. which added additional cost. Because there's just portions of each building that lays itself out to have a three-bedroom unit. So that's really what it comes down to. It's, 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 you could then you really can't make it a two-bedroom. You'd make it maybe a three and a, and a one or a two and a one, which then you start messing with the demographic profile of having too many one-bedrooms. So there's a very tight balance of the unit mix that you need to achieve. I know you mentioned that you haven't done affordable housing. I'm not talking about Section 8 housing. I'm talking about workforce housing. Uh, you know, people who are making 50, 60, 70 thousand in a household income level. Uh, are are you amenable to negotiating uh, an arrangement with the town uh, for this uh, Eighth Amendment uh, uh, related to affordable housing? Um, we know that the affordable housing is an issue, um, but and we we are looking forward to working with the town through that. I don't believe that this project is designed for that. That's not to say that as we get into it, we don't. I don't know how it works. I mean, I've had some discussions um, about uh, percentage units and. Uh, know whether we could make a, a fee in lieu of affordable housing. I think that's we're well aware of that is, but I don't. 
you know, I don't want to turn this project into a camel and then have it not work for anybody. So um, we understand that that is of concern and uh, as part of the planning board and th that it will be part of this discussion. You would be uh, open to considering fee and lieu arrangements to discuss those? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions before comments? Council member comments on the Council Chiazzo? So, um, a couple things. I try and break this down into its least common denominator for me. Um, so uh, I see the pros as, uh, well, I'll do the cons first, being the ever pessimist. I know everybody's shocked. Uh, so the cons, um, expensive rents. Uh, this is a pretty high-end project. Um, but again, it's commercial. So if their markets, their rents aren't in line, uh, they'll have to adjust one way or another if they want to fill vacancy. It's kind of their business model. Um, I don't necessarily think that will negatively impact us at least up front. It may impact us long term on the uh, tax revenue generated by the property, but um, if, there's a, if there's a need for it, there's a need for it. I don't really think that um, while I'm cognizant of the need for workforce and low income housing, I don't think every project can accommodate everything all the time. Um, I think we've got to be aware of the fact that um, there are uh, potentially higher end rentals uh, out there and there are people who are willing to pay that. And if they are, the market will support it. Uh, so be it. That's their business model. Um, the growth permits, I don't necessarily see that as a negative thing. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of within our, our bailiwick at this point. We've, we've got 137 per year. We've got our reserve. We're not going to exceed the reserve with this. Um, that to me is a discussion for another time. If it's first come, first serve, they're in line. Um, if they're going to phase it out over a couple of years, that certainly helps. I think it's important to remember that we're not doing 800 in one shot. We're, we're going to reset the clock next year, and then we can decide whether we're going to replenish the reserve and to what extent and, and how we want to do it through that process. Um, the pros, I, I see this as, as uh, kind of the biggest thing. Um, it's, let's not forget this development in Hagus. We've been talking about this for 20 years. Okay? Um, you know, how many projects have gone by the wayside because of a, an indecision or market factors that haven't kind of played in? They're shovel ready. Um, this is not all of Hagus Parkway. It certainly could be a catalyst, I think, for more investment, more potential. This is one of our key goals. It's been one of our goals. So from a financial perspective, um, the development of Hagus has kind of been a, a, uh, a, an anchor or, or an albatross around our neck as a town for a while. Uh, I think this is an opportunity. I think we should take advantage of it. Uh, and then uh, the last thing is the impact on town services. I, I really don't see um, the growth going to come to the town one way or another. Um, I, I certainly see a project like this as being less impactful than a 200-unit single-family home development or 150-unit single-family development. So uh, I certainly can support the contract zone amendment. I, I think the planning board will do its job. Um, I think they'll negotiate um, whatever the requirements are and, and they'll, they'll work in the best interest of the town, but I don't, I don't see any reason not to move it forward. Thank you. Other council comments? Council St. Clair? Um. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't see. I don't see any issues with this. Um, I think this is a project that would do really well in Scarborough. I think there's a need for it. Um, you know, it's been fr it's been frustrating. As a, I've been on the council now for a long time, um, and it was frustrating to watch um, by the wayside as Scarborough Downs crumbled in front of us, and to to feel helpless to be able to do nothing about it. Um, that was a large property. That was a, a, a lot of plans that people wanted to do, and um, it was met with so much criticism and so much backlash that um, people ran away from it. Um, and I, I think there is a time for, um, and it's our responsibility to the citizens of Scarborough to nitpick at certain things and to make sure that the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Um, but I also think there's a time where um, we put our, we have to put some of our faith and our trust in our planning department, and that they're bringing forward stuff to us that um, is going to be beneficial um, and is going to bring in revenue to this town. And you know, one thing I, I constantly hear from people in this town is they want to keep their services the same, and they want great schools, and they want um, their trash picked up on time, and they want snow removal. Well, all of those things happen from revenue and from the money that we get from from um, businesses and from um, 
housing in this town. We can't provide those services if we don't allow this town to grow more. Um, and yes, we are becoming, I know it's getting annoying that I keep saying this, we are becoming a small city. We are growing and we do have to control some of that. And that is our job. But I don't see that this project is going to be harmful at all to this town. Um, I think it's going to be extremely beneficial. I think, yes, it's frustrating that we would potentially have to wait five years for revenue fr from it. Um, I hate that part of it. Um, but I think on the flip side of that, once we get past those five years, that's a lot of money um, that's going to go into the budget that we desperately need. And we lost out on the revenue that we could have gotten from the Scarborough Downs project. And I, I hope and pray that we're still going to see something come out of that. I hope we're going to get something. Someone's going to come in and develop that area. That is, you know, and I'm grateful that this is over by Hagus Parkway. This is something we've been talking about for years and years. And we haven't had anybody really take a good bite out of that area. And to see if this slips away, it's going to be extremely frustrating. Um, so I, I, I have, I'm going to support this and do everything I can to see it move forward. Other comments? Council Rowan. So there are a number of things that I really like about this project. Um, I'm tired of the empty lot that sits there. Um, I live very close to it and sometimes jog through the empty lot and I enjoy the wildlife that I see, but you know, it's, uh, I think it's time to develop that thing. Um, I like this project. Um, I think that there's, um, there's a real need uh, for diversity in the housing stock in Scarborough. Um, and I think that uh, this project really provides um, that. We don't, we don't have a lot of the, the high-end multifamily rental in Scarborough. When you drive down 95 on your way south, you see quite a bit of it. Um, I think that um, you know, HUD just had its, its analysis for 2015 through 2018 and was talking about the, the need for uh, more rental units in the, in the greater Portland area. Um, I think I, I heard a comment from Mr. Howard earlier about um, the, the statewide um, median income, um, and I'm not sure that's really applicable um, to this project because the Portland um, median income is, is considerably higher, um, and we also have a, a very low unemployment rate, um, and we have a, a essentially a um, getting to the point of labor shortage. Um, the, um, the area median income around Portland is, is much higher than, than statewide. Um, the, the, I, we did bring up affordable housing. Um, we also have a need in, in town for um, diversity, uh, socioeconomic diversity. Um, and um, I, I think when, when we talk about um, density bonuses in other zones, and I'm, I'm not sure about the Hagus zone, um, but this is, a, um, this is a contract zone, so we don't have to do anything necessarily. But we do offer uh, density bonuses um, in exchange for a percentage of you know, affordable units being built. Um, there is uh, an opportunity for um, an in-lieu payment to get, to get out of it, but I, I think a, a community like this would be well served um, with some diversity in, inside of that community. That would be up to, you know, the developer and, and the managing partner to, to decide if they'd like to, to do an in-lieu payment or, or actually build and, and serve the house. I mean, from my perspective, um, this, you know, the skill set of, of um, this collective um, is building housing um, and, um, and so therefore we would have an opportunity to actually uh, have some houses built with, that could be uh, rented to income qualified families. Um, and when we talk about affordable housing in Scarborough, it's, it's really important to note that, that uh, we're not serving the Section 8 population. We don't have a housing authority like uh, Westbrook and South Portland and Portland. Um, we, but what we provide in our guidelines and how we've defined affordable housing is 80% of area median income. Um, and so for family of four, that's 60 plus thousand dollars a year. So the, the, um, the rents that um, those households would be able to afford would be in the, the you know, uh, the affordable definition is 30% um, of income, including utilities. So the rents that could be, that could be paid by um, an income qualified uh, individual at, with a $60,000 income is 1500 bucks a month. So it's not that these, these uh, units would be given away for free. Um, you would just be providing some diversity, socioeconomic diversity inside your community. Um, so I, I think as part of the contract uh, zone amendment that, that we're putting forth, 
Um, this is first reading. I don't think it would be inappropriate to um, amend this further um, to include a, uh, an affordable housing component um, in exchange for the, the density and the fact that we're going from a requirement for 60% commercial down to zero. Um, I'm very uh, cognizant of the fact that we don't want this project to become uh, economically unviable um, because of the, the demands that we're putting on it. Um, but I do think that um, some percentage would be uh, appropriate um, inside the, the zone. I, I guess I'd like to hear um, other feedback from other councilors before I offer that amendment. Yeah, I guess <clears throat> I'm in a slightly different place, and I, I don't think I'll be voting to support this tonight. It has nothing to do with the project. It really has much more to do with sort of our process and how we got to where we are. My concern is, as council members, we all took our goals were no surprises and to have complete transparency with our constituents. And, you know, as you've heard tonight, a lot of us were surprised as councilors last week about the pipeline. I'm pretty sure most of our constituents out there in the audience have no idea about what we're talking about. Two, I'm a little concerned that we're doing this just before Christmas. I mean, if anybody's household like my household, we have a bunch of people inbound tonight. We've got shopping to do. I still have, <coughs> luckily there's still shopping days because I've done none. So, <laughs> But people are just really distracted. So to me, it's more of the process. We've heard a lot about the business case of why this makes sense for the town. What I reflect back on the workshop we did have, it really struck me, Suzanne Foley Ferguson talked about the last time they did a comprehensive plan process. They actually went out and polled the residents of Scarborough, what do they want their community to look like. <coughs> they did raise a concern about their preference was for single family housing over this type of housing. We haven't updated that, we haven't done that, so I'm a little bit concerned about that. Rocky Rispera also talked about saying the last time we did the comprehensive plan, we did a really good job of getting the zoning right, getting the provisions right. He really cautioned us against making major changes. We're talking about making some changes. So I would, I, and then just as we got, we asked a lot of questions from the workshop, we got answers yesterday, we're finding out new information. If this isn't gonna go to the planning board until late January, I would love to take a little bit more time to kind of get some additional questions answered and so we can get a little bit more comfortable. My big question is, how do we account for the permit? So I'm uncomfortable, uh, I, I love the project, I think it has merit. I'm just concerned about where we are in the fact that I, I bet 90% of our constituents out there in the audience have not seen any of these materials and they probably are not really up to speed. I'd like to be able to take the time to get some input. I put something on my Facebook page today, got a couple responses back. This is really off the screen of most people, they're really confused about what we're talking about. I think we owe it to our constituents to at least inform them, engage them, and let them have, have their say. So that's, that's my position. I I'm sorry, I didn't see who I was I think first. Will was first. I, okay. <laughs> um, so I, I forgot a couple things. So. <laughs> but I'd also like to respond to uh, Councilor Hayes' comment. Um, I think that in terms of engaging um, our constituents, this is the, the first reading there'll be opportunity for further discussion as, as we move along and, and there's another, there are more opportunities for public input um, for, and public hearings through the planning board and then again for us at before second reading. Um, but I, I think a couple of the things that I like about the project. Um, the, uh, we've suffered a little bit from a chicken and egg problem on Hagas Parkway and I think that, um, that this kind of resolves some of that issue in terms of where that uh, development might go. I like the fact that there's still a spot there for some commercial development that could be put in um, for maybe some restaurants, and at least on the drawings, the initial drawings. And then lastly, I, I wanted to just highlight um, the, the positive ROI that was uh, brought up at the, at the workshop, meaning that, that uh, the, because of the low, uh, the belief that, that there will be a lower um, impact for community services or need for community services, that the actual tax, tax revenue um, will exceed that. We don't see that in uh, single family housing. We don't necessarily see that in a lot of commercial properties. Um, but, um, but I wanted to highlight again that as a positive. Councilor Foley. So I kind of think of this as a holiday cookie. Like who doesn't want a really good holiday cookie, right? It looks great. It's, it, in and of itself, this project is fantastic. The area is clearly in need. And as everyone has said, I think we'd all be in agreement that Hagas Parkway, we need 
some things to start happening there to attract more things. You know, um, it's like throwing that first pot of honey out, and then the rest of the bees will start to swarm. We hope. Um, I my biggest concern is similar to Councillor Hayes in that I have had four and a half days to view the the full scope of the project. Um, I was unable to attend the workshop last week. I was able to view it over the weekend. The audio isn't the greatest, but one of the things that struck me in the workshop was a comment um, actually by counsel, a former counselor, Judy Roy, who stated that historically in town, uh, this type of project had not been very widely supported. And so I too feel like I just want to make sure that constituents have all the information that they need. Um, so on top of the only four and a half days for me to kind of catch up, and I realize I'm the newcomer to the council table here, um, and that's part of why I'm maybe feeling more behind, but also less than 24 hours since we got our answers back. So it seems to me that this has been a, obviously an ongoing project for a long time. You have tons of work. So had we had <coughs> a greater opportunity with a longer time period, even two weeks between meetings, to kind of view, and I, I haven't even had the opportunity to have a good lengthy discussion with any individual counselor on this. I talked with Chairman Davine very shortly today. But so, so time and pace is my concern. Um, that's why I asked the question about financing. It's not that I don't support the project, um, but like a holiday cookie, one holiday cookie can be really good for you. Ten holiday cookies, maybe not so much. And when we look at the pipeline of projects that we have coming down the road, it's that layering effect that I worry about. Um, that said, I do understand that you know there will be a lot more that would come out of uh, the planning process and it going. I mean, I, in my, if I had my druthers, we'd wait till the next comp plan was done because that's happening this year. I realize that's probably not realistic for you folks at all. So I am willing to support this uh, tonight um, with strong trepidation and, uh, and and a desire to learn a heck of a lot more um, as it goes through the process. If that makes sense. Sense. Okay. Councilor Donovan. Uh, just touch on some of the things that I think are, are important. Uh, I think it's important that this is the first reading. Uh, I think it's important for uh, the people who are proposing this to understand that uh, I think several of us, maybe all of us, would like to see uh, elements <laughs> of the uh, contract zone uh, uh, Eighth Amendment negotiated further. Uh, that's important to me. Uh, as far as timing, I think we have probably two to three months where this is going to be in front of us. The planning board process, I think, is critical. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't, but I am now glad that I'm liaison to the planning board because I'm going to go to each of those hearings and immerse myself so that uh, I can at least provide a flow of information back to the other six of you. Uh, uh, I fully accept that uh, Hagus Parkway needs a boost uh, and uh, we should not miss the opportunity because we have to work harder and faster uh, than we might like. Uh, I much prefer the deliberative process but that may not be quite as possible uh, but uh, we'll never make a decision that we think is not in the best interest of the community. I know that we're all together on that. Uh, I accept that the revenue uh, from property taxes uh, uh, will eventually be a very valuable element to the community because I think the case can be made that uh, uh, this will be a, uh, a net positive, a considerable net positive. Uh, I worry about the schools because while other situations may indicate that it's not a high school impact, uh, Scarborough has a very good school system. And so, uh, and this is a wonderful location. So I think people will be drawn to the project. I think it's going to be successful. Uh, but I want it to be both successful for the people who are developing it and for our community. And if we burden our school system, that will be a, a, a real negative on this. So uh, that's why I was interested in the three-bedroom issue. Uh, for me, I need to see how this thing plays out. I'm prepared to support it for first uh, reading, but I want to see where things go. 
uh, uh, and uh, we'll be making our decision, I think the seven of us, based on what's best for Scarborough. Councilor Kiyata. Yes, so I just wanted to address the issue of timing. Um, you know, I, I think we're, we're I, I want to, I guess, I think it's important to point out, um, we're not being asked to fast track anything. We're not being asked to expedite anything. We're following normal due process. As investors and as business people, they have a right to ask for timely decisions that are in line with the normal way that we do things. Um, you know, if we slowed every process down and we delayed everything, I think we'd find it very difficult to do business in town. So I want to make sure that we understand, that the public understands, we're not expediting anything. This is the normal process. There's a normal timeline. Um, there's due process in there. There's numbers of checks and balances in there and opportunities for the community to weigh in on multiple levels. Um, being first reading starts the process, gives them a little bit of understanding of where they're going, gives us uh, a commitment to move forward and begins that process moving forward. So um, I think it's important to point that out, that this isn't, uh, we're not being asked to do anything extraordinary in this process. Um, two, uh, two things I wanted to mention. One, um, keep in mind that when we approved Mussey Road a, a couple weeks ago, they were talking about $1,800 rents. So this isn't, Ex this, what they're asking from us is not outside of the norm. Um, I think we need to keep that in mind. I understand the need for, um, I've always been a proponent of asking every single unit that goes in if we can get affordable housing. Um, but I think that, and I think Will, you probably understand this best. Um, there's a big difference between affordable housing and lower income rent. Um, and what contractors have to do to qualify those <laughs> apartments or those condos or those duplexes for low-income housing. That's something that I don't think is always explained really well um, and needs to be explained to this council because it is a new council. Does that make sense? Um, and I think that we would benefit from maybe a review of the differences in those things. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say um, really quickly was um, I'm happy to hear that Councilor Donovan is going to, um, is on the planning board as a liaison and is going to be paying attention to all of these. I think there was a breakdown in communication and that's why a lot of us were so surprised. Um, I myself, when I got that list, and I said this at the, um, at the meeting, um, was frustrated by the fact that we seemed so surprised by what was in the pipeline. Um, and that, to me, is a, there's a breakdown in communication somewhere. We should have been apprised of all of those situations. But that, those, those things that had been approved should not have been surprises to us. And so I think that either our liaisons have to start doing a more thorough, better job on some of these bigger um, committees, or we've got to figure out a better way for us to be kept in the loop of this stuff. Because there should never be a surprise of over 800 units that are coming to Scarborough, ever. That's an embarrassment as a counselor. In my, uh, on my part, I was embarrassed that I didn't know that. Um, and I'm the one that has to answer to the constituents when I say, oh yeah, did you know that this was happening? And they're like, no, did you? And I'm like, oh, no. That's, an, that's, my, that's my failure. Um, and I'm the person that has to take responsibility for that. But let's figure out how we make sure that this council is kept aware of all of those projects that are going on. Whether they're going to happen or not, we still need to know if they're being discussed. Councilor Rowling? So, uh, two, two things. Um, first, when, I, when we were discussing Muzzy Road, uh, my understanding was that uh, Mr. Rosbear was talking about rents for the one bedroom of 1150 um, to 1200 and then the, the, in the $1,400 range for the two bedroom. Um, I don't know. That's I'll correct. reach out. That's right. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, and then sec secondly, so the, the Scarborough Housing Alliance has uh, a set of guidelines that we've put together to provide to um, Eastern Village, which is the first time that we've de dealt with rental um, income qualified uh, individuals and uh, or rental units. Um, and essentially the, um, the, the process is that it's up to the manager to uh, the manager of the property um, is responsible for every year in making sure that the individuals that are renting the units that are that are uh, meeting the um, affordable uh, requirement um, is doing an income qualification by looking at their um, 
their uh, 1040 um, and looking at, at their income. Um, so that's how, how they're validating income. Uh, and then they're certifying to the town that, that that's the case. Um, the, the guidelines are saying that, you know, they're not designated special units um, for affordable, um, but they are, um, they're, again, they're just members of the community and first class citizens of the, of the development. Um, so we don't have a lot of experience because that's our, that's our first um, pass through and, and Mr. Hall might have more information on that. No. Well, <laughs> sorry. Not on that matter. May I just ask him the rebuttal question? Sure. My concern is that when properties are being built in these subdivisions, or um, we had an incident down the street where we were promised some low income housing, and I believe my concern is when it's under construction. There are certain things that you have to do at, when it's under construction, and please correct me if I'm wrong, to <coughs> qualify or to make those units low income or affordable with the state. Is oh. that correct? There are certain qualifications that you have to meet as a contractor, and I that's where it gets tricky. I think you're referring to the, the Section 8 housing, uh, and for that, I believe that that is the case, and we're not talking about Section no, 8 here. Our, our Scarborough uh, requirement is a, is a local ordinance that we've attached. No, no, no. I'm not I know about the ordinance. Zoning. I'm talking about not Section 8 housing. I'm talking right. about low-income housing so when no it's under construction. I thought that there was a piece that the contractor had to meet certain requirements with the state for it to be deemed low-income housing. So if I can, um, if I can just interject, um, so to you folks, I'm actually a banker, <laughs> and I've dealt with these projects. So to the council's point, it depends on the financing structure in which they've received from the bank, and if that is actually backed by the state okay. or by another agency that supports low-income housing. Um, in which then because of those um, lower rates that they're getting, uh, the interest rates that they have to pay, then they do have to meet certain qualifications, um, whether that starts with the construction or whether that starts solely with the uh, types of units. I'm not 100% uh, familiar on it, but that's, the, that's, that's really Section 8 housing. It is not because of the financing tool that's being used. Okay. My understanding is that this is not mm -hmm. such a financing tool, so the, therefore it's whatever we decide as part of our contract zone and our local ordinance. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Can I just add some clarity to the pipeline? And I apologize for the sticker shock, but keep in mind, 100 units of that 850, mm -hmm. 40, uh, 853 were approved 10 years ago. Right. They're just by coincidence now coming online. Um, about 80 others were in front of you through approvals of TIFs and contract zones uh, about two years ago. Uh, again, coincidentally, <laughs> for all sorts of reasons, they each had their own struggles. You heard Avesta finally get funded tonight. It's just coincidentally coming online. So it's, it, it, it does look like a big number, but a, you know, many of these have been touched by this council um, and certainly been approved for some time. And then, of course, we have two big ones that really kind of uh, tip the scale. So if I can just clarify through the chair, uh, there was a question about uh, what Mr. Rispera's comment was or quote was for rents. One bedroom, 1250 with heat and utilities included, two bedroom, 1400 with heat and utilities included. Excuse me, heat and hot water, not utilities, heat and hot water included. Thank, Thank you for you. the clarification. Council Foley? I forgot a couple of things. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Will forgot some so I could too. Um, <laughs> uh, I, number one, I was uh, happy to hear that I, I'd like to uh, Councillor Donovan's question around you being potentially amenable to uh, considering the fee in lieu of uh, potentially allocating affordable housing units as a possibility. So I'd love to hear more about that conversation as it goes back to the planning board. I agreed with Mo Erickson earlier who said the community needs a pool. I hear they're going to have a pool there. I don't know. Um, I'm a swimmer, so that would be a good thing. And. Uh, what I also wanted to mention that I thought was interesting is I, I knocked on probably 800 to 1,000 doors during the campaign, and I was asked very few questions about anything pertaining to local issues. Um, this particular project, interestingly enough, was on uh, the radar of at least two constituents that I had no prior relationship to. So um, I put that out there just as a point of reference for the rest of the council that it's interesting. Those two constituents were not very supportive. Um, they also didn't necessarily have perhaps 
all the information that they would need. So I think when you see a council perhaps being somewhat tentative in terms of how we move things forward, um, it's because we want it to be successful. And, the way, and, and what we've learned about how to make things successful is to not have people feel surprised. Whether they should be surprised or not, that's a whole different thing because perception is, um, is their reality. So thank you. Yes. Other comments before I make a couple, if you don't mind? Yes, go ahead. So I, I think I, I threatened to add an amendment. Um, I think I made my point, uh, and, uh, uh, and that there'll be time for staff to negotiate, and it goes through the planning board. So I, I think uh, I'm comfortable without an amendment on the first reading. Uh, but I would like to say that if we, that, that I'd really like it to be addressed, and if it comes to second reading, then maybe there, I'd, I'd have something more formal. Great. Um, not seeing any other questions or comments from, uh, from the other councils, I'd like to add a couple of comments for myself, a couple of personal and then some observations. First is um, I appreciate Councilor Rowan's acknowledgement of the um, amendment that he wished. I think that there is a very strong sense that we would like to have this as part of the conversation. Uh, um, I kind of understand and agree that this project might not be one that actually employs affordable housing under the definition within the project but there might be an advantage for the town as a whole to take that into consideration for us to be able to grow as a community and can be part of um, that process going forward. Um, I think it, um, first I, I really want to say thank you to everyone who participated in the workshop process that we had it um, a week ago. Um, it was very quick, but we had a very good turnout and it was very um, uh, pleasing to uh, receive the comments and the rec uh, suggestions from everyone as well as the input we did have um, all of the town council there. Um, we also had members of SEDCO present, as well as the planning board, long range planning, and affordable housing. Affordable housing. So it was a very well, um, um, a very good opportunity for us to kind of go through at least the beginning stage of getting information, and I appreciate that. You know, what, one of the speakers at that session was Dr. Gail, um, and I apologize if I pronounced this wrong, but Brazo. Um, who was a member of the SEDCO board who spoke very eloquently about why this project is needed in Scarborough, and that is because of the demand in the entire region and not just the composition of where we live today in Scarborough or in its, um, in its proximity to the main mall, which is what a lot of people kind of look at when they think about these projects um, and how close it is. It's about reacting to the economic climate that we're in and responding to the workforce um, environment that we have in York County and on our borders as well as in Portland and we see the struggles that the city of Portland is having with its rental properties or its rental market where their downtown is really not becoming a rental market anymore, it's becoming a condominium market. Um, so this is a, to me, a very nice um, opportunity for us. I think the placement of the project is absolutely perfect um, in um, conjunction to both um, its acreage, the density um, bonus that's being asked for. Um, given that proximity to where it is, um, to the highway and to the other services and the composition, I personally do not have a problem with 39 three-bedroom um, um, units in this particular project given its size. Um, I was at one time one of those executives. I have a four-bedroom uh, uh, four bedroom single-family home here in Scarborough. I lived in a three-bedroom uh, condo apartment in both Boston as well as Indianapolis and it was for executive purposes and family purposes with having a home office. So I can see that being a big part of that. Um, in fact, uh, I would love to downsize out of my four bedroom single family home into a three bedroom apartment, um, especially on snow days when you have to shovel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I also wanted to um, suggest, it, so I started off with a timeline of amendments to a similar project. It's, it's really about the fact that over time, and we have been dealing with, I think this is the 20th anniversary in which we first started contract zones, um, 10 years since this particular um, kind of uh, this area has been started to been talk about. And the fact is that every council has been willing to make amendments and adjustments to the contract zones in order to meet the demands or meet the requirements to be able to project out growth um, in this area and to focus on it. Um, I think that this is just another iteration of that. I don't think that there is anything wrong with the process that's been undertaken. I have full faith in the staff that's come forward with its recommendation. That's what we pay them to do. Um, so I don't have a problem with that. I have the full faith and confidence within the planning board that they will vet. That if you think our questions are going to be tough, I know that their questions are going to be tough, especially uh, when it comes to landscaping with one particular planning board that's been there for many years. Um, so I know that it's going to be vetted properly. And it's going to be done very thoroughly and that we will have the right process in place so that we also vet that for our citizens and for them. You know, um, 
There was a comment made that the citizens really have no idea, of, um, and I always add the R into that, so I apologize, I'm trying to change it. They have no idea that we're undertaking this. I think that they elect us to make that decision for them when they aren't knowledgeable about this and that um, we will do the due diligence and the homework. So I'm comfortable in making that decision tonight and I am in support of that. Um, I did want to mention, um, this is about, so I've been here actually, although the, not the most, um, not the longest consecutive counselor, I am the longest serving counselor, at least amongst um, these folks. I've actually been serving since 2000. And so I've been here when um, Haggis Parkway was first um, thought of um, when it started to get developed, when we talked about um, underground utilities, when we talked about, I saw uh, the debate that this community had when People's Heritage Bank, which was the original bank that talked about moving here, um, it was a very different situation because they were actually looking for a tax rebate um, rather than any issues about zoning um, that weren't favorable. It's now TD Bank and their facility out in Falmouth is a very nice facility um, and is still there. Um, you know, we've also talked about Fairchild coming, um, who knows what's going to happen with them, so whether that was a good issue or not. The issue for me and why I'm kind of reflecting on that is that um, we've taken 20 years to think about what we can do, what we want to do, and we haven't been very successful. This is an opportunity I don't think that we should lose um, and take too many chances on. Um, you know, as I said to my wife before, you know, burn me once, shame on me. Um, I don't get burned twice, and I think that this is the time for us to take this risk. Um, and while we can be cautious in the process, um, it does cause us to actually make a decision, and I think that we should be ready to do so um, with the full faith of our community behind us. So I am very much in support of this. And by the way, um, so the other reason why I think um, it was brought up, I can't remember who talked about it, but there are two key factors that make us really, or force us to make this decision now, and that is the market. Um, we're dealing with higher construction costs that are um, already starting. I'm already seeing um, higher interest rates within the market as a banker. Uh, particularly longer term uh, rates and notes. Um, so this is an opportune time for us to kind of partner uh, in making that right decision rather than us going kind of solo on it. So I am very comfortable in moving this forward and know that we'll give its proper due diligence um, as it goes through. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Any other comments from Council before? Yes, Council Rowling. I think it's pronounced Haggis. Thank you. <laughs> so the HP zone. <laughs> <laughs> any other comments? <laughs> Not seeing any. Uh, the will of uh, the council. All those in favor? Raise your hand. All those opposed? And that's a six to one vote. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming in. Yeah. Um, if we could take a, uh, a two-minute two minute recess uh, to let our guests uh, break down and uh, depart. That would be great. Thank you. We'll be right back.
Council meeting back to order. We just had a short adjournment to uh, have our guests uh, leave, and we can move on to our next order of business, which is order number 16-083. It's an act on a request from the deputy tax collector for a waiver of foreclosure on the following properties for David Drive, map T003, lot 004, 29 Matthews Way, map T003, lot 029, 13 Crystal Lane, map T003, lot 013, 15 Crystal Lake, map T003, lot 015, and 20 Garnet Drive, map, map T003, lot 020, and to authorize the town manager to sign the necessary documentation. Can I have a motion? So moved. Actually, excuse me, I apologize. I need to open for public comment first. My bad. Would anybody like to speak from the public on this matter? Not seeing anybody, a uh, motion please. So moved. And a second? Second. Uh, council comments or questions? Oh, it's a funds. Uh, oh, yes, please. No, I hate when, you know, I hate seeing this stuff. It always just like, you know, I, it, I understand it's a necessary part for what has to happen and people need to, you know, do their part and pay their way, but I always hate seeing this stuff. Um, I do, I do always know that the town does everything they can, um, you know, to try to help people get through these kinds of things. And I know this is always our last ditch effort. So um, obviously, I'll fully support it and um, have full confidence in the town manager to deal with it. Just if I could, we continue to work with all these folks um, for which automatic foreclosure is is pending very soon now. Um, in the in the event that they're not able to meet their obligations and the lien does mature, this at least gives us the security. And, and actually, the action you're considering is uh, an act of compassion. We're, right. we're we're not foreclosing, on uh, and uh, it's really not a position the town wants to be in. Council Rowan, when, when what, so if we pass this tonight, I'm assuming that we, I mean, I'll, I'll probably support. I certainly I'll support this. Uh, but when, so it would no longer be an automatic process. It would now be you'd have to take. Affirmative action to do the foreclosure. Right. I understand. Thank to you. Stop the foreclosure from happening. So we're we're taking the action tonight to stop the foreclosure. If we still need to foreclose in the future, it would then be up to you to absolutely. We continue to file new liens for unpaid taxes, and the cycle begins again. Got it. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, can you refresh my memory? Um, before the uh, lien is placed, isn't generally that's about 18 months after the actual tax payment is due? Exactly. So this is not um, taxes that are due for 2016. We're talking now about taxes that were due in 2000 and early 2014, maybe even, I'm sorry, late 14, early 15. Yeah, tax lien takes 18 months to mature. Okay. So they're passed. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure uh, citizens knew that. Um, any other comments or questions? Uh, not seeing any. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. Next item is order number 16084, act on the request to authorize the town manager to enter into a service agreement with the town of Wells for vehicle maintenance and to sign any and all documents. And I'll uh, turn that over to the town I manager this first. This is the last time I'll be before you with this matter. Um, this dates back to actually the last budget cycle. Uh, uh, Mike Shaw at Public Works uh, identified a need for some additional vehicle uh, techs, but not enough need to hire a full-time person. Uh, and at the same time, he was talking to his colleagues in other towns who were lamenting over the fact that they were paying high price for fairly poor service. And Mike came <coughs> forward and were able to actually provide uh, vehicle maintenance services now to the towns of Old Orchard Beach and, and Hollis. Uh, and this is for a fairly specialized uh, kind of the pumps, the specialty work. It's not for full vehicle maintenance. And that's why we're, we feel very confident we're capable of handling this additional workload. Um, just as a final reminder, we had always intended of bringing on uh, Westbrook, but that did not materialize. So the combination of this and Hollis kind of balances that out. So we're very pleased, and uh, everyone we're working with seems very happy with the, the arrangements. Councilor Chiazzo. Uh, question for the manager. Uh, could any chances that Westbrook may come back to the board at or to the table at all, or is it, was it a pretty definitive no when we're moving on? Uh, it was a definitive no. We waited six months, frankly, and, mm -hmm. and uh, it, I think the manager there understands that we needed to uh, make some different decisions, and I, I don't expect they'll come back, nor could we accommodate them, frankly. Did, did, did they give, sorry, if I could just quick follow up, did they give an explanation why? Just uh, it was political. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. Sorry, was that political? Political. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think one or more elected officials uh, had family members on public works staff. Um, you can just imagine. All politics is local. Councillor mm -hmm. Hayes, I believe you won. Yeah, just a quick question. I think this is direct at the town manager. I think last time you confirmed it too, but this is a net revenue position for us, right? Yes, we're actually. Um, more than cover our more than cover is about a 25 percent margin for us, okay. um, and at the same time, it still is a very very good deal for yeah. the other parties. Thank you, Councilor St. Clair. I just have to say, I think you know, I have so much faith in Mike Shaw and his team, and I mean, <coughs> every year they continue to mm -hmm. blow everything out of the water with what they do. So, I mean, he's he knows what he's doing. He runs a tight ship, um, and if this is something that he's um, proposing in all four, um, I have every confidence in the world that this is exactly what we should be doing. So, thank you. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Um, I have a question. Um, at what point do we determine a saturation point in our ability to service other contracts um, outside of um, our own municipality? Uh, this is, in my experience, professional experience, this is the first time we've actually uh, hired <laughs> staff and. and and sought this business. Mm -hmm. Typically, there's a synergy or some sort of relationship that happens organically or by crisis sometimes. This one was a little different that we saw an opportunity, and to Mike Shaw's credit, he really made it happen. Um, under that model, there's really no saturation if we want to get into this business. Uh, I think we need to be mindful, and I am, that we have a core business to support, which is to maintain um, excellent services for our citizens, first and foremost. So I guess that's the thing I'd be concerned about is if we get to the point where we're not doing that anymore and worried more about providing performance mm -hmm. under a contract to someone else. Uh, and I'm comfortable that we're not anywhere near that at this moment. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, not seeing any. All in favor? Um, that is unanimous. You didn't have a motion? I oh, we did. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm on the next one. Sorry. Shoot, it's okay. Apologies. It's okay. <laughs> Keep me straight. Um, next item is, let's see, order number, um, order number 16-085, act, um, act to accept donations to the town of Scarborough received in 2016 for the Eastern Trail, close the gap campaign, and to ratify the memorandum of understanding dated August 31st, 2016 between the town of Scarborough the Eastern Trail Alliance and the Eastern Trail Management District. Um, with that, I would open up the floor for any public comment. Not seeing any, um, motion from the floor. So moved. Second. Uh, town manager comments? I've got a prop that's going to help me. <laughs> <laughs> By way of background, uh, and this council uh, is, I think, acutely aware because this council provided actually $216,000 of funding toward this project. Uh, there's a larger gap, and we've been diligently fundraising in the community. Councilor Hayes has been a very frequent member, and we're pleased to see Councilor Foley attend the last meeting. And the arrangements that we've worked out, uh, there's really a great uh, group of talented folks and committed to this cause. Uh, we've worked an arrangement out uh, whereby the Eastern Trail Alliance um, has been receiving the majority of these donations and have in turn turned them over to us for safekeeping, if you will. And what's important about that is that should we be successful and ultimately let a contract, it will be the town that actually lets the contract. So I would always like to have money in house and in control before we agree and sign any dotted line. Um, to date, we've done quite well. Uh, there was great press today. Just as an aside, um, what's been received as of, you know, um, what's been received so far is about $106,000 in donation and there's 100,000 of it here. Awesome. This is between uh, all sorts of smaller donations and a big matching grant of 50,000 from the Eastern Trail Alliance. Uh, so we're well on our way. Just today, uh, Town & Country Federal Credit Union was announced that they have a $100,000 donation level, which is terrific. Amazing. And so we're starting to build some steam momentum. Forgive me for going into that background, but what this is about is just uh, legitimizing, if you will, the mem memo of understanding we have with the Eastern Trail Alliance, and technically the council will need to approve all donations. I'm not going to necessarily bother you every meeting. I'll probably do it monthly or as needed in batches. Uh, so you'll you'll see these coming as uh, as our success grows. Excellent. Wonderful. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, a little bit of background too. This actually kind of 
you know, what was the birth of this or sort of the origin of this is we actually had some contributors that really felt more comfortable that rather than having the Eastern Alliance actually have the money that it actually ended up being here in the town coffers, they just felt more comfortable that that really guaranteed the monies were going to go for their purpose. So some of this was really to help kind of ease the, the contributors, you know, peace of mind about what we were doing and stuff. So a couple of us asked us to do it. So the other side totally of that, support the other side of that, individuals and corporations often aren't comfortable giving money to government, sure. frankly. So it really mm -hmm. works out well in that regard. Eastern Trail Alliance, their name says it all, and I think that it really is a good relationship we've, we've sorted through. Council Donovan, uh, was there a deadline by which uh, the monies had to be raised, or we ran the risk of losing state funding? Well, there was a deadline from DOT, who is the chief funder for the end of this calendar year. Uh, we've had meetings most recently, and that is uh, not a hard deadline, but um, we don't really want to publicize that. We want to keep the pressure on and uh, really build on this momentum. But we do have the full. full uh, support of DOT, which is key in this. Huge. How far do we have to go? Uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, I think we're still in the $400,000 range, so there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. I'll clear and then Um Is the Eastern Trail Alliance, are they a registered nonprofit? Are they a nonprofit? I believe they are, yes. So when people make a donation to them, then they can, there's nonprofit, their nonprofit status, so that with corporations, Absolutely. I'm sure that helps. Yeah. Yes, in fact, I'm looking here at the moment of understanding they are a registered 501c. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I, it struck me that we also authorized a sum of money that was going to expire in a certain period through finance. I think we set some money aside. Do we need to revisit that anytime soon? Or? The, budget, uh, the budget authority doesn't lapse. Okay. Um, it would, uh, it's a capital item, so we would never borrow until we need it. Right. Uh, but the authority doesn't lapse. So no, okay. no further action required. Other comments or questions? Not seeing any, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you. Next item is order number 16-086. Act on the council chair appointments for council standing committees and council liaisons. Um, in the form of a motion, I'll read those and then um, if you would, um, Allow me, then I can uh, make a comment under councillor comments or councillor uh, questions and comments. Um, in the form of a motion, um, I would recommend that we move approval of the following appointments for the 2016-2017 council year. For standing committees, appointments committee, um, councillor Chiazzo as chair, councillor Hayes and councillor Donovan. Finance committee, councillor, ha councillor Hayes as chair, councillor Chiazzo and councillor Babine and councillor Rowan as an alternate. Ordinance Committee, Councilors Donovan as Chair, Councilor St. Clair, Rowan um, as uh, members, and Councilor Foley as an alternate. Communications Committee, Councilor St. Clair as Chair, Councilor Foley and Councilor Hayes. Rules and Policy Committee, Councilors Foley, Councilor Foley as Chair, Councilor St. Clair and Councilor Donovan. Fair Hearing Committee, Councilor Rowan as Chair, Councilor Donovan and Councilor Chiazzo. Council Liaison Appointments um, as follows. ADA Advisory, Councilor Foley. Coastal Harbor, Councilor Hayes. Conservation Commission, Councilor Foley. Community Chamber of Commerce, Councilor St. Clair. Eastern Trail Alliance, Councilor Foley. Eco Main Board of Directors, Councilor Donovan with a term to expire in 2017. Energy Committee, Councilor Donovan. Firing Range, Councilor St. Clair. GP COG, which stands for Greater Portland Council of Governments General Assembly. Council Chiazzo, Manager Tom Hall, Assistant Manager Crockett, Health Safety and Security, Council of St. Clair, Historical Pre Preservation, Councilor Rowan, Housing Alliance, Councilor Rowan, Library Trustees, Councilor Babine, Long Range Planning, Councilor Chiazzo, Councilor Rowan as an alternate, Metro Coalition, Councilor Donovan, Organics Committee, Councilor Donovan, PAX Policy Committee, Councilor Chiazzo, The Pest Management Committee, Councilor Donovan, the Planning Board Liaison, Councilor Donovan. SEDCO, which is Scarborough's Economic Development Corporation, Councilor Rowan. The Senior Advisory Committee, Councilor Rowan. Shellfish Conservation, Councilor Hayes. And the Transportation Committee, Councilor Chiazzo. And that was in the form of a motion. If I could have a second. So moved. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, first is um, to, under um, to undertake that task. I thought it was going to be um, not quite as complex, but 
uh, trying to match um, everything um, was a little bit of a task, and I hope I was uh, successful um, because I did want to take into four considerations in those appointments. First was um, I did have a chance to speak with um, each of the counselors and try to meet their requests and their needs as well as their priorities. Um, I also wanted to make sure that each counselor was chair of at least one standing committee. Um, I wanted to match the council's experience with each appointment, especially as it relates with seating a chair and on those committees, and then to find synergies in the work that we have on those standing committees also with the liaison positions. The best example of that is um, I would suggest is Councillor Donovan. Um, as a, now as a board member of um, EcoMaine, he will also be our liaison to the Energy Committee, which has been very, um, working very hard on uh, dealing with solid waste management and our um, waste management uh, policy within town, which is a significant part of our relationship, obviously with EcoMaine that processes our waste. So there's other synergies that I hope that you will see and feel um, with those appointments. I think they're very important in us um, being successful. I did want to mention um, a couple of changes and some special notes. First is that um, I did eliminate, because um, they were not approved committees um, or other positions um, by previous um, councils, but um, I think were situational. So I eliminated what was called the Employee Incentive Plan Review Committee. Um, I believe that was something that came out maybe three, four years ago. Really has not been um, a committee that has been formed over the last couple of years. And I think that with some activity that may happen within the Appointments Committee, we'll be able to incorporate, I think, the intent of what that committee wanted to on the longer range plan as well. The other piece was really, it's an elimination, but it's really not, it's an absorption. And that is the school board liaison position. Um, in speaking um, with each of you, as well as with um, Councilor St. Clair, who is the vice chair, um, I feel it a responsibility that as two leaders for you and on this council that we have a responsibility in building that relationship with our school board. Um, we are the leaders for you um, in, in that relationship. We act um, or at least uh, present ourselves on that behalf. And um, I will always remain the lead on that, but um, Councillor Sinclair will also um, assist me with that as well because it's, you should have confidence in your leadership to be able to communicate with our partners and that is a significant piece. That is a fairly new position that was created, I think, three years ago, um, somewhere around that. So, um, you know, and I do want to mention um, very specifically that while I'm absorbing that um, responsibility in the leadership roles is that Council Chiesa, who has been very effective in the past year, um, will remain a very strong advisor for us as well because um, it's an important relationship. Um, I also wanted to um, mention that um, the Communication Standing Committee was originally approved as part of one of our council goals, but never formally um, written or formulated in our um, rules and policy. I am going to ask that rules and policy formulate that on a permanent basis. Um, it was originally uh, positioned as a one-person kind of job, and I think it's very clear that um, at least this past year, communications was a very significant part of our goals. I have a feeling it's going to be a very significant part of this year's goals and it's really too much, I think, for one person to take that responsibility. It will be a three-person committee that will become a permanent committee uh, for the council going forward because it should always be our focus on um, both from an internal and external basis and um, kind of aligning, again, the synergies. Um, Councillor uh, St. Clair will be the chair of that committee for us as well, um, giving kind of the role with the school board as well. Um, and then, um, sorry, I already made the note regarding um, communications. Um, last, I, I just wanted to say that I really think this is a slate that is going to allow us to achieve a lot. Um, I think that um, given our past experiences and the depth of knowledge across the board is um, going to make us extremely successful and we'll have some sub substantive results at the end of the year. So I really appreciate all of you contributing to that process um, and allowing me to make that recommendation. So, Council St. Clair. Um, in your motion, you just forgot um, the Public Safety Building Committee wasn't on that topic. Yeah. Um, and that's because it was actually appointed by resolution, so I would not need to reappoint that. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. You're, already there. You're already there. Sorry. Any other questions, comments? Councilors? Not seeing any. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you. Sorry, this thing goes off very quickly. Um, the <coughs> last item, uh, so there are uh, item number eight, there are no action, uh, non-action items, there aren't any. 
Um, item number nine are standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Um, if you could speak to your previous appointments possibly, that would be great, um, or any decisions that uh, you can announce for your new appointments. And I'll start with Council Donovan. Uh, uh, we ha I had my first uh, meeting as chair of the Metro Regional Coalition, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I'll report more on that as I get more familiar with what's going on. Thank you. Uh, yep, uh, Scarborough Housing Lines met. Um, we really had more of a strategic planning, goal setting uh, meeting. Um, we did get some uh, 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 troubling is too strong, but we got we got some kind of rough news on on the Eastern Village. Um, uh, the developer had been planning to uh, meet his uh, some of his. Um, obligation with some one bedroom uh, apartments and uh, we were informed by uh, it was caught that those only count for half um, so in the in the current phase that he's under he's, he's only meeting three instead of six um, it doesn't really material change anything other than the fact that the developers on the hook for um, ten instead of seven right. so, uh, then um, but we did get the great news regarding Southgate yes um, which is fantastic. Uh, I, I'm sure you all recall, since we've been talking about multifamily housing a little bit tonight, um, that uh, that there were 38 affordable units um, that were approved two years ago that that were waiting on Maine Housing um, Housing Authority to provide some some tax credits, um, and uh, we we were able. The our bid was. Um, by the skin of our teeth approved and we, we were able to get a half million dollars in, in uh, funding. Uh, so that's going to move forward. Um, SEDCO also met um, and we had a lengthy discussion regarding shortage of labor. Um, it was the morning after the, uh, the workshop last, last week. Um, so, so one factor that was also discussed was um, uh, a contributing factor is um, housing options in town. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilor Foley, anything? I do actually. Excellent. So, in anticipation of uh, tonight's announcements of committees, I uh, heard of there was going to be a Eastern Trail Alliance meeting this, earlier this week. So, I attended just uh, it, with the intent of meeting the folks at the table, uh, working with Councillor Hayes to kind of catch up to speed on the work that they've been doing, and I'll continue to pick his brain um, as I take on that role. So, it was it was really nice to meet them. They've obviously done some great work. Um, so it was also fun to feel like there's something I can immediately have uh, some connections with that will be helpful for them. Cool. Thank you. Council St. Clair? Um, do you want me to do public safety? Or do you sure. Go ahead. Um, the public safety building met last week. Um, that's going well. We actually looked at it. It was kind of frightening a little bit. Um, the <laughs> fire department, the chief, chief Thurlow presented us with sort of an overview plan of um, this area and what sites or buildings we have available. Um, and it was a little sobering to look at that map and realize um, there's not a lot out there and there's not a lot of options um, for that public safety building. Uh, we are going um, January 11th? Is it the 11th? Mm -hmm. January 11th, we're going on a tour actually. Um, we're all going um, up to Topsom and um, Topsom, Brunswick, Westbrook, Saco. Topsom, Brunswick, Westbrook, Saco. Um, we're going to tour those buildings and kind of those are all newer buildings. Um, meet with their chiefs and kind of see what works for them, what doesn't work for them. I always think that's really important. Um, and so uh, we're going to do that. I think that was it for them, right? Not much else came out of that. And then um, the only other thing I have because our committees haven't really started meeting was. Um, our communications, my communications group, um, we're going to hopefully set up a meeting for next week, uh, not next week, the week after. Um, and I'm hoping in between that time to meet with Tom and possibly SEDCO um, to talk about how we want to see communications move forward, what we think the best way for that to do, what the best use of our time will be, um, and how we see, since this is a new group, um, I understand it's going to go to rules and policy, but I would like to um, have some input on shaping that, and I'd like to get that information from um, Tom and SEDCO, uh, since SEDCO is vital in uh, the newsletter, 
um, and things like that. So I think that's important. Um, and if any of you have opinions on how you'd like to see communications moving forward, you know, email that to me um, because I'm going to put something, an outline together to send a rules and policy for them to sort of implement something. Other than that, I'm good. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, a couple things. One, I'll kind of piggyback on the public yeah, safety. Please. The other piece that was really fascinating is they did share a sort of a volume of places in town oh, yeah. that we that the emergency visits are made, and they were kind of a bubble chart. So it really kind of centered around, you know, the the main med center, that's the cancer center. There was a lot of visits there. Some of the nursing homes are a lot. So it really helped kind of show where they're going, and so it was kind of fascinating. Um, two quick updates for me. Um, Coastal Harbor Met, uh, they're doing some crane repairs, which is nothing new. They're always doing yeah. short of crane repairs. <laughs> uh, but the thing that they did do, I, I had shared earlier that there's been a lot, of a lot of conversation this year about the right use of or the appropriate use or how do we use the sort of Pine Point co-op area. How it's, you know, there's restaurants there. There's people that are recreational using it. Commercial fishermen are using it. And so there was an ad hoc committee that was kind of formed about how can we do that, how can we provide parking, how can we provide recreational users in there, have their final meeting in January, and then they're going to come back with some recommendations. So that will probably be coming our way at some point in time, but that work's progressing. Um, and the second thing is just kind of a heads up. We've Every year the um, Shellfish Conservation Commission always has a heated conversation about licenses and what we should do. This year in particular, there um, it really is the, the pretty evenly divided down the middle about what we should do. There are some that feel we should not increase licenses, others that do. Um, we're going to hear their recommendation, I think, next meeting. Um, there may be some very engaged participant public comment, I would say, that might come our way. So just kind of a heads up that that's, that's coming. So that's it for now. Thank you. Councilor Chiazzo. Uh, so uh, the school board met last week. Uh, they had their um, legislative workshop, if you will, uh, in, in addition to their long-range planning uh, report done. Um, several counselors were there. We were invited to participate um, at the table. Um, and I'll keep the politics out of it, but suffice to say, the, um, with question two, I believe it was, for the school funding, um, there's still a little bit of angst and consternation about how that's going to play out in Augusta. So stay tuned. Um, it's obviously beyond our control and the school board's control. It's up to the legislation now to determine the best way to move forward. So um, certainly if you have opinions, um, send them on up to Augusta. Uh, I'm sure they would just love to hear from us. Um, the Long Range Planning Report I found very um, interesting only because I was involved in that process from the very beginning. I think there was a lot of good takeaways from the report issued by Harriman Associates. Um, uh, discussed with Councillor Hayes a little bit the format um, and uh, the information that was presented both as a way to um, maybe do something on the municipal side for our existing infrastructure but also as a way to maybe qualify some of the public safety uh, building requirements. I thought it was a very um, intuitive format if you will. So um, certainly hope that we could take some learnings from that as a, as a council and as a municipality and, and maybe piggyback on some of those efforts. Um, I know it's been very positive on the maintenance side of things for the schools as well. Um, Energy Committee met. Um, we met uh, Carrie Strout, the, um, I believe, sustainability coordinator. I think we settled on that for her, her yep. job title as opposed to jack of all trades. Um, so um, she, she met. Uh, we got to meet her for the first time. Very excited. She brings a lot of energy and a lot of knowledge to the process. I think Bill's going to very much enjoy working with her, and I know he's uh, work with her on a couple other things as well outside of the uh, committee. Um, and they also went over doing the, um, I'm going to say the comprehensive review, but they're looking at revamping the energy policy as a whole and um, using some of the STAR guidelines, if you will, as a basis for that. So there's going to be a lot of work for that. And um, Bill, I was told that um, part of me passing the baton on to you was that you are now responsible for munchkins in the morning. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, other than that, that's, that's all I have. Great. Um, Town Manager report. Yes, I will give you just the high points. I uh, just want to report back in. We've been successful in meeting with representatives from Senator Collins and King's office regarding the so-called 21st Century's Cures Act. This was a, kind of an omnibus bill that was passed just about two weeks ago, frankly, that uh, intends to address all sorts of problems in our society. Uh, one of which is the opiate 
uh, addiction, and there's uh, potentially as much as a billion bucks being put toward this. It appears as though it's going to flow through the states, and so there's there's still some. We'll have to wait a bit to see how that's going to flow, but hopefully, um, the senators are working on our behalf to get that released sooner than later. So we're we're quite hopeful in that regard. Um, Tomorrow I will be attending a full day tax mediation uh, session. This is on the uh, different tax appeals. We both parties have agreed to have an uh, independent mediator to help us sort through that. And so I'll certainly report. Uh, they were seeking, they were seeking that I, uh, wishing that I had some uh, specific authority, and I told them that I didn't have that. And so anything that, if we come to some tentative agreement, would be subject to bringing it back to you for approval. Uh, and the, the, that seems acceptable. And um, lastly, I think Councilor Baybine and Chairman Baybine is going to speak to the fact that we did receive the legal opinion on Avenue 2 today, and I believe he, uh, I'll be providing that um, as a public document tomorrow. Uh, we see no reason not to share this to all those that are interested, and I believe he has a proposed kind of process and timeline that will be an important part of that conversation so folks know what to expect. Anything else? No, I, everything else can wait. Um, actually, that's a perfect walk-in. Um, so um, in receiving the um, uh, opinion, and just to uh, kind of be clear, um, the former, uh, former Chairman uh, Donovan had met with um, interested parties, um, so we want to make sure that we meet the expectations of those interested parties and the promises that we uh, made are kept. Um, part of that is making sure that this is a transparent um, but an appropriate process. Um, so with that, um, since we are in receipt of the opinion, we'll make that public tomorrow, like uh, the manager said. Um, so it will be on our website. Um, I believe counselors have already received that in their email as well. Um, and it, if you are asked, uh, of course, um, you can distribute it now that it's going to be public. I did want to mention that, um, so at the next meeting on January 4th, there will be an executive session uh, for the purposes of consultation with legal representation under Maine Statute 405.6.F, or is that an E? E. e. Uh, which is uh, concerning legal rights of the council um, regarding uh, contemplated litigation uh, with general discussion. Um, and that will take place at 6 o'clock on the 4th. Um, I would mention that at the tentatively, um, unless there is um, a conversation at a later time, we will have a public workshop um, in which we will make sure everyone is invited for February 1st. Um, and then um, we can determine at that workshop what the next step is um, at that particular time. But those are the two attentive. I don't have a, day, a time for February 1st, but it will most likely be um, around the same time frame that, you know, whether it's 5 or 6 o'clock, um, we'll do what we can to accommodate everyone's schedule. Um, so I'm going to give you back that if you don't mind. Um, for uh, individual comments, just a few comments. Um, Bill, I did, um, Councilor Donovan, I did want to mention there is one additional assignment that's not on that list. It's a subset. So as a, now, as the member of the EcoMain board, you will also, because Scarborough um, is a significant owner um, within, uh, within EcoMain, you'll also serve on the executive committee. Um, it's, a, it's a guaranteed, or it's, um, it's our position that we must fill. So I wanted you to be aware, it's certainly on the same day as the other meetings, but I uh, wanted you to be aware of the responsibility with that as well. I um, wanted to mention I have sent out emails to um, all of you for two items, if you could take attention to that. Um, First is, um, or actually there's three. First is I am wrapping up everyone's um, goals that were handed out to the sheets, I'm trying to kind of um, consolidate that into a couple of working documents that will help us begin the conversation in setting goals for the, um, for the uh, upcoming year. But also it will help us determine what step I, we take um, in having that conversation. And so the second email that I sent you um, is also a request uh, for some opinion and response regarding that process, particularly um, do we wish to um, simulate the same process that we had last year, um, asking what were the, um, the positives as well as uh, any concerns or negatives with that so that we don't um, obviously uh, emulate those problems again, um, as well as asking do we even need to follow that same process since we were so successful but also asking some other questions about how you would like to um, approach this 
Um, Tom and I did have a meeting this week um, with uh, last year's consultants at Delphi Group. Um, it was a very good meeting in which we talked about last year and kind of where we are and what we might be thinking going forward, but I really need your feedback whether to then engage them in this process because they'll need to put together a proposal um, and recommendation around the timeline. I also indicated in that email two possible dates for workshops. Um, the first is January 9th, which would start around 5.30, 6 o'clock. It would be a two-hour session. That is a Monday night. Um, the second is also, um, the second is January 11th. Um, again, whatever the time frame that we select, it would probably be the same. I'm not suggesting we need both. I'm suggesting um, we need one. Um, it depends on how you wish to go forward. If we're going to use the consultant, we probably will need both. If we're going to um, use um, our own resources, I think that we might be able to summarize that in one meeting or at least have one and then a backup if we need <coughs> to follow it up with anything else. So we can, you know, I'm waiting for that feedback from all of you, um, so please uh, respond. And then um, the second is that I actually want to continue something that I started last year. Um, I think I've heard back from everybody but one, maybe two. Um, so I had these coffee corners that came out of last year's uh, communications discussion and goals, and so I had made a personal goal to sit down with each of you um, before sitting in this seat. Um, and I'd like to actually continue that just as a counselor, um, just to talk business and um, about the town. And so if you could do that as well. It's only two of us, so there's no disclosures or inappropriate meetings happening, um, and we, we never have more than the two, so I don't want anyone to worry. Um, we already talked about engaging the consultant. I did want to mention that um, regardless of which path we take regarding our goals, I do want to make sure that we have an opportunity to look backwards and, and make sure that we all are comfortable in defining how <coughs> successful we were last year um, before we start going forward, so please uh, take that into consideration. Um, I did want to ask for each, for the committee assignments, I wanted to ask each of you um, in your respective uh, roles to, if we could have at the next meeting um, an announcement about when the standard meeting time and dates are going forward so that we can make that public announcement for our own schedules as well as for everyone else. I think that would be a good information point um, to include in your reports if you don't mind. And um, just a couple of um, personal comments. Um, First, um, so, because this is really my first meeting, so I, I, I apologize for the rough spots. Um, um, even though I've been around for a while, it's always a, a new role, and so I hope I can work out any of the rough spots that happened tonight. I know we will, as you get more comfortable, it always does. Appreciate your patience through that. Um, the other part is I, I really wanted to say thank you. Um, one of the things over the years I never understood is that um, once you become a chair, the chairperson, for some reason it automatically allowed the chairperson not to serve on a committee or serve in a liaison. Now there are other responsibilities and duties in trying to manage the issues. And um, um, not that I wouldn't love to be able to just do that. I really wanted to remain active in the committees as well as the liaison. So I really appreciate uh, your confidence in being able to serve on the finance committee, which is in my over 20 years, I think it's the first time the chairperson has been able to sit on a committee as well as in a liaison, so I appreciate that flexibility. Um, and I know that the library trustees are very happy as well, so uh, thank you for allowing that. Um, I really wanted to say thank you also for the confidence um, in appointing me as the council chairman. I take it uh, very humbly. Um, I'm going to work very hard, and I promise that we are going to have a very successful year. Um, I don't take failure um, well, so I guarantee you that it will not be a bad year. Um, and in that, I, you know, in thinking through what type of comments, you know, you think about what's been published around about our regional neighbors um, without naming names. So as soon as I give you the examples, you're going to know. You know, they, we talk about um, some leaders talking about literally and figuratively giving out olive branches because of the difficulties they had. Um, others talking about the need for respect and civility. And I hope that if anything, our, our mantra this year is don't fix what's not broke. And the fact is, what we, what we did last year worked and does not need to be fixed. And I hope that um, we expand upon that, because I know that we can be very successful uh, with that. Um, and although we did very well, the only thing I want to ask is that, um, that we believe in what we do, that we need to believe in what we do and think hard about what kind of changes we want from our work so that as we begin the process of assessing last year's success, and in setting this year's goal, we set a realistic understanding of what we need to do and what we want to do. 
Um, and so I, I really want to say thank you with that, as well as, um, and I should have said this in the beginning, I really want to thank the school board and the superintendent in particular uh, for reaching out and, and um, inviting us uh, to the workshop. I thought it was a very good workshop. Um, it was extremely informative regarding um, um, trends that the school department is facing regarding state issues. Um, a lot of them are focused around funding issues that we were aware of, but there were other issues as well as their long-range plan regarding facilities. Um, so it was extremely, um, I, I thought it was a very good session, so I really appreciate that effort. And last but not least, I just want to say Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everybody. So um, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Do we get, do we get so comments? Moved. Sorry? We didn't. Anybody oh, oh no, so talk? moved. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought you guys talked. No, 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 so moved. No, 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 I am so, oh my God. I have one. See, I am so sorry. I need a, you know, oh, oh my God, I just jumped in. Did I really do that? We could do the very thing. Oh my God, oh, that's because I did. Oh my oh, God. No, I am sorry, council comments. No, I, oh my God. That's because I was thinking about the reports, and I talked about reports. I apologize. I'm sorry? You don't have another chance. I will not spek again, I promise. <laughs> yeah. I will not speak again. Council Donovan. Uh, I'll limit it I'm to so congratulations to Landry French Construction, which was uh, in the newspaper today as having received a Governor's Award for Excellence. Mm -hmm. And they noted several other uh, prominent awards. And this is an uh, 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 employee-owned company. And so obviously uh, a company that's doing a lot right. And it's a Scarborough company. I wanted to recognize them. Thank you. Council Rowan? So uh, I also wanted to thank the, the superintendent and the school board. I thought the presentation was terrific, um, uh, very informative. Um, um, I also wanted to um, mention Southgate again uh, and that, to remind everyone that not only was it providing affordable units, it was also uh, preserving a historic and important building in town. And so that's another reason to be really uh, grateful to the Housing Authority. Um, and then lastly, um, the, um, the police department um, and the, the volunteer, volunteers in police service um, have been hanging out outside of Wentworth helping with the, the drop-off recently, um, that, which is, was very well needed. Um, but um, but uh, so I wanted to thank uh, Officer Greenlaw and the volunteers for um, uh, standing out in the freezing cold. Um, but I also got to talk to uh, Ed Libby uh, the other day. He, uh, it's really weird when people, um, I think it's the first time somebody, somebody actually knew that I was a town councilor um, by sight. Um, <laughs> and uh, he wanted to say um, how much he appreciates the, um, the uh, senior tax credit that we did this year. Um, it's making a big difference for him. Um, and uh, he, he really wanted to especially um, thank uh, you, Bill, and, and you, Craig, um, because uh, you guys were really instrumental in making that happen. And, and um, he indicated that he'd be watching, so Ed, I, um, and that he would uh, just would have liked to come and do it in person, but it wasn't something that he was going to be able to do. So message delivered. Uh, I'll be quick. Another thank you to the school board and also the legislators who all attended and fellow counselors. Um, I thought it was really informative, eye-opening in terms of what they're looking at in terms of potential uh, facility needs in the future. Um, so that's also something I was thinking about tonight. And then that's Merry Christmas. Enjoy the time with your family. Councilor Chiazzo? Oh, um, yeah, so I'll keep it brief. Um, happy holidays, uh, Merry New Year. I wish us all a wonderful time with our families and friends and a very prosperous and healthy New Year. I'm looking forward to continuing the good work we've been doing. So happy holidays to everybody. Same, same theme. Happy holidays, everybody. Enjoy. Council St. Clair? Can I make a motion? <laughs> <laughs> no, really. Happy, Merry Christmas. Listen, let me get on my soap. <coughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, oh. there, I'm just kidding. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. I hope you have a great um, holiday. And I do want to say, and I know it's bragging, but I'm going to brag for a minute. Um, um, I run a foundation in my son's memory, and um, we were awarded a uh, $5,000, I'm so tired, $5,000 grant um, from Town & Country, actually, the credit union gave away $25,000 to local charities, um, and we were actually the recipient of a $5,000, the highest grant they gave, um, and it was a wonderful thing, and I just have to, major kudos to Town & Country, not just because we won, but because um, of all of the things that they're doing in this community, which is um, huge right now. 
So um, very proud of them, and it was wonderful to take a tour of their building, um, and it's, they're doing some great things there. So Merry Christmas. Thank you. And before the adjournment, I want to apologize. That will, it's that transition from, uh, from committees to comments, so I apologize. That will not happen again. Happen again, and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Who moved? So, and who seconded? Second. All in favor? Uh, Thank you. Uh, Night, everyone.